Okay, tip number two to get the transcoder for today. Stream. Yep, got it. Second try. Been getting the transcoder within two tries this month, which is good. Right. Hello. This is stream number 438. I'm doing more Rust coding today. I'm working on game data conversion between uh, JSON and SQLite. So the intent is to take all the game data that's been, you know, building over the last couple of years and get it into SQLite so that uh, I can keep developing the game using a real database and not a huge JSON file. Hey there, Riley Monkey. How are you doing today? You are first. First in the stream. So, hey there, Mr. Halsey and Nui. How are you? Nui's number two, Mr. Halsey number three, at least the order that I saw it in. Can't chat long, just got a COVID vaccine shot. Good job. All right, so this is the format of my game's data right now. Well, as of today. In JSON, you can see it's 11,000 lines, and this is just the uh, test area. This is not even, production is 10 times as large. So the goal is to get this into um, an SQLite database. And I've been working on this in C++ as well, and I got quite a far, quite far into it, and I need to do it in Rust. So um, migrations has sort of the schema of the database so far, and I'm going to be adding to this. Um, so wasn't streaming a lot last week. Instead, I was kind of working on this stuff where getting all of the things that uh, need to go into the database in, I got everything but the entity component system. So all the all the things outside the entity component system, which I really hadn't touched before, are should be, as, as far as getting them into the database, it, it should be working. And I have it uh, tested with the, with the test system, test platform, I guess I should say. Hey there, C17R and A squared. How are you doing? Waiting 15 minutes to go home? Yeah, you don't want an allergic reaction. And hey, they're liking. And Cloud Hawk. All right, so a lot of things are going into this globals table. So basically, everything from the original game data that had just like a one off thing like that or that or these two are um, game globals now. Uh, temporary entities table is this guy. Um, the here's the mail queue stuff right here. Uh, metrics is in here somewhere. Where do I put metrics? Wait a minute. Oh, metrics. Metrics right now only has a global, which is total time. That's the only thing I'm pulling out of metrics. I I might not pull anything else out other than this because this really never really had much use for it. So yeah, this is all the data about players. This is outside the entity component system. So all the traditional things like the name of the player, when they created their account, how many points they have in my stream, who they are on Twitch, uh, their password hash and all that stuff, uh, two-factor authentication stuff, if they're banned or not, you know, all that stuff is is held in that table. And then all these things which are sub tables here, like for example, if I go into here and show Backup OTPs, those are here. So basically any in interior arrays like the chat ignore is here. Chat tabs is two, a two level structure there. Events is all of this stuff. And um, the tickets that you've seen are down here. And then the ticketing system itself is a couple tables, right? There's the tickets and the, the history of each ticket. So that's as far as I've gotten. And um, now I'm going to add the entity components, entity component system stuff. Hey there, Rambane TR. How are you today? Mr. Balrog, apparently COVID vaccine causes constipation. When I got yours the other day, they told you I had to wait three weeks to get number two. Ah. Okay, Mr. Balrog. <laughs> Sarian, how are you doing? Wait times for vaccines also because there can be delayed stress response, passing out from low blood sugar. That was mostly allergic reaction, but okay. Lentil stew dragon, how are you doing? Blood pressure too high, let's reduce that. Ah, uh, stress, let's lower the heart rate. I see. Except normally those two aren't supposed to happen together, yeah. <laughs> yeah, SQ light today. 
I'm going to be using Rusculite. Rusculite. Bundled is to pull in the C code bundled with the Rust crate, so I don't have to worry about building it myself. Get COVID shot number two this Saturday. Good job, C17R. I didn't know programs needed the COVID vaccine. Basically, after 20, 15 minutes, you're good. You're probably fine. Yeah. Need the Ferris emotes for Twitch? There might be a BTTV emote we can pull in for that. Here in Sweden, they're vaccinating the elderly first. They haven't gotten sub-70 yet. Every place is different. Yep. Every place is different. All right, so... The design of this tool really is to have two modes, import or export. Import is importing the data from JSON, and exporting is exporting it back to JSON. You might ask, why do I bother exporting it back to JSON? It's sort of a round trip deal where if the original is here and I import it and then export it, I should be able to get back the exact same thing, right? So uh, let me collapse everything. This is the original right here. This is when it's gone through its import export you can see it's only 613 lines on the way out it was 11,000 in because all of the entity component system is not yet pulled over also um, some little things in metrics are I'm just choosing to drop them for now so let me go over into a little example little example of that hey there's uh, 715209 how are you today and metro dev somehow I missed a wave to metro dev where was that missed it Missed it. There it is. Woo SQL. Yeah. Saw your message. Didn't realize I should say hi. And Metro Dev, look at that go that brightly sparkling gold gear you have too. Thirty to four years old, not get vaccine till late summer or maybe even autumn. I think it's like by well, depends on the country you're in, Mr. Balrog. In the U.S., they're saying by, they're hoping to be my, by, uh, what, May or July? May, June or July? I can't remember these things. Hey there, Lazy Guru. How are you today? Sweden, I see. Let me go through an example of stuff that I did off stream. So, uh, I don't know what's a good example. Like this temporary entities, right? So the import for temporary entities is to, um, well, first it starts at the, at the um, definition of the JSON structure. So this basically represents this here. So the um, components, which is at this level, has this next entity ID here, and then this temporary entities array here. So I'm leveraging JSON, uh, CIRD JSON. So we can um, use this CIRD attribute rename to say that in JSON it has um, camel case because that's just how it is with the old version of the game. But then, in, and without needing to make a camel case in Rust, we can basically say it's named this in in, uh, ser in serialized form, but here's a different name. Have you a fair amount of providers that are not delivering the vaccines here for some reason or another? Behind on schedule? Yeah, that's the case in a lot of places. Just barely fat enough your, is your justification to qualify? Yeah. Wife well, said both because she works for healthcare. Yeah. So that's happening in the U.S. too, that um, you can become eligible if you're in a certain uh, group of people. That is not just your uh, age. CRD rename is nice. Yep. Could you CRD rename all camel case? I guess I could. I feel better about this because now if I, there's any kind of abnormality, like I don't know if it would if it would assume that. You know? Not not quite sure that I would trust um something that would just blanket all of them. Um what was I going with this? Yeah, so this is this the uh format of each of, of one of these. So it's just client server entities. And here's an example where I don't need to really mark it up because it just knows a hash set is just an array in JSON. And um, numbers, right? So all the magic, most of the magic happens in the derives, which come from CRD. So in a sense, this is independent of JSON. It's how to serialize it in general. And then in um, the main 
there's one big CRD um, deserialization that happens right here. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. So we just say CRD JSON from reader, which means we're going to give it a buff reader. So make a buff reader. And it's going to read from a file that we've opened. Um, so it's, e it's actually easiest to read this from inside out, right? First, we take the path to the snapshot file. We try to open it. This with context says if there's an error, then wrap it with some more information about that error, which is that you can't open the file. This is the name of the file, and then it'll have, like, as its source, the underlying reason why we couldn't open the file. So um, the question mark would be an early exit if there's an error there, right? So if we uh, don't get an error, that file gets opened and passed to the buff reader, which says basically wrap a, a memory buffer around that so to, to make it a little bit more efficient to read. And then we give it to CRD JSON to say, give me a JSON from hit this. And CRD JSON from reader is, of course, generic on um, the, the uh, thing that we're reading and also the type that we're deserializing, right? So the magic of generics is that as, l as long as I use this in a context where it needs JSON, and I give it something that supports the uh, read trait, then we're all good. So it knows it needs to be JSON because... Oh, I mean, uh, sorry. Not that it needs to be J JSON. The, uh, this type T, right? How does it know the type T? Because I specified it here. <laughs> I could probably drop that, though, now. Because it should figure out from the context of where I use it down here. Okay, here it doesn't, so I guess I still need, yeah, type annotations are needed. That's my, that's, that, that's, it's basically telling me it can't figure it out early enough, so. Yeah, take the file, parse it as JSON, and follow this serialize, the, this deserialize implementation uh, as the recipe on what the format is, right? So it will, um, this basically, again, matches the overall uh, snapshot file, and the components are right here, which is what I'm going to work on a little bit today. And so right now, I just have this, and this is pulled out separately, and I'm going to dig into the, the bulk of the data here, which is going to be a, a different set of tables for each of these kinds of components. Now, probably you've seen me last year working on this a bit in C++, so hopefully it'll go more smoothly now. Maybe I can re re reuse some of that old code too. Thank you for the follows. I appreciate it. I suppose I'll just start at the top. So caps, these are capabilities for entities. So entity 523 has the M capability set to one. So this is all abbreviated, right? Entity. This is component, and this is um, the value of the component for the entity 523 for the component type caps. And the M stands for movement. So all of these entities can move in the game. There aren't very many because this is just the test environment. I think 523, if I remember right, is my character. So if I just search for 523 and find like the player component for it. Yeah, so that's me, I think. It's uh, going to be tied to me through the PID, the player ID 1, right? Yep, okay, so let's collapse all that again. Just going to be looking at the uh, caps for now. So th I need the parent, which is like a wrapper for all the different types of components. So let's add that first. You don't need to and shouldn't abbreviate now. Yeah, I'm trying not to. That's just why you'll see me do these renames. Yeah, in the in the SQLite, I'm not abbreviating. Uh, where where was that? Here. You can see I'm I'm not abbreviating any anything. Even um, what was it? Where I had the the word entity, I didn't use e anymore. I just said entity. Character entity. Right? Hardly. Some things are still abbreviated, like email instead of electronic mail, but eh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I think it was a bad idea for me to abbreviate originally, anyway, because it's really just hiding the fact that this is a really inefficient format for the data, right? Okay, so. Um, First thing, let's go to the first things first. 
we need to uh, add in the correct place here to match. I kind of want to match where this is, like from top to bottom. So components goes above next entity ID, right? So it goes here. Pub components, game snapshot components container. This is as good a name as any, right? And then pub struct that, make it serializable. So let's just add caps is um capabilities so capabilities is another structure okay so that's an array so really this is a vector of them so if capabilities is one of these there are two entries a c and an e right so there's a c and an e the E is pub entity, which is a, um, did I, oh, a U32. I need to be consistent about the type of my entities. And I have to be conscious that I can't have more than 4 billion entities in my game. <laughs> hey there, L. John CL. How are you? And Grumpy Game Dev, how are you doing today? Oh, hi. So, not caps like you wear in your head then. Yeah, that's right. Capabilities. Are you doing, using any migration stuff for the database? Yeah, so um, this is the migration tool, really, for the data. There's also going to be built-in built migration of the schema over time if we add more tools. So this whole migrations thing is every one of these entries would advance the um, version of the database itself. And the, there's a little migrate function here that remembers what migrations have been applied and then applies them in, in a transaction one at a time, right? Insert that we're, we did it and then put and run the migration script. So I have both. Migrating the schema itself over time and then migrating the data from the JSON. Maybe you have a type alias for that? Um, I missed what, we're make, what I would make a type alias of. Oh, look, for entity? Probably a good idea. <laughs> so they don't have to keep remembering it's U32. Um, maybe put it at this level? I like that, Sarah. I'm going to give you a point for that. Thank you for the follows. I do appreciate it. Remember you're talking about making this change to JSON? This yeah, so I had started making the attempt even when I was still working on the game in C++. And... It kind of got off into the weeds and was really ugly. And then at that point, I just at some point around then, I'm like learning Rust. And I'm like, I still have to do that in Rust, but let me do it cleanly. Leverage things like CRD JSON. It should be a lot better, right? So that's what we're doing. Because once I get it into, oh, I forgot to show that. Once I get it into a structure in Rust, the import from there is pretty straightforward uh, for this level, right? It's um just um execute SQLite statements that pull from that those structures. So that next entity ID just goes in as a global. Temporary entities uh, fill in rows in the temporary entities table, right? So um, the mo most of the overhead here is just dealing with filling in parameters. That's how you do it with RustQLite, is you make a, um, a slice of all the things to put into the, the question marks. So here there's one here, down here, there's three of them. And, um, to handle things where the types aren't the same, like this is a structure, uh, this is a U32. These all happen to be U32s, U32s, but they, 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 you could use a mixed type slice because this params wraps them at, with, with, uh, trait objects. Um, just makes it look nicer. So, um... Anyway, yeah, the overhead here to express the parameters and then the fact that we might have errors. So the the execution of the statements might fail. And then um, on export, when we're going the other direction, we could get failures because the, um, the individual things we're getting from the database might not, ha not, be, not, might not be the right type. If you guys hear the flute in the background, that's my son playing the flute <laughs> for his class. What do you call a ghost chicken? A poultry geist. Good one. <laughs> Did you hear that? What do you call a poultry chicken? Or a ghost chicken. Sorry, I screwed it up. What do you call a ghost chicken? A poultry geist. 
Okay, got a chuckle from that one. <laughs> hey there, meme clear, meme clear bams. Thought you're meme clear bombs. Meme clear bams now. And please compile. How are you doing? I need to take a uh, hydration, ten second break. What's a ghost's favorite primitive type? The boo. <laughs> Is that, is that a dad joke? The programmer joke. I remember this a couple weeks ago. Yes, and my memory is like that of a fish sometimes. My apologies. Okay, I added components, which has capabilities. Or I didn't fill this one in. The um, caps component itself. I think it's just movement, right? So it's... Component, right? Capabilities component. Which is another struct. Oh, and I have to add these derived macros in front. That's kind of joke. You both said it at the same time. A programming dad joke, I see. All right. That flute's gonna... It's coming in at an unfortunate time for me, but I'll try to focus. So this is movement, right? And I think I was just making that into a um, bit mask. So I'll just keep it right now as a bit mask, I suppose. So movement, 32 bits, probably more than I need. Thank you for the follow. Okay, so what's next here? The import, well, I need a table to store it, right? Yeah. So, I don't know, I'll add it up here, I guess. Oh, and uh, shoot. I had bookmarked the C++ code that had it already. Yeah, this is where I had it. I wanted to not make it from scratch if I already had something to base it off of. So that's what I had it based off of. Just convert it from C++ to Rust here. Uh, not abbreviate. Mobile? Yeah, okay. All right. So there's our table we're adding. There. We're not, we're not abbreviating. <laughs> Don't miss that comma. Oh, thank you. I did miss the comma. You just guess, and when it's wrong, you guess again. Hey, sometimes that works. If there are only like two or three possibilities, and you're you're pressed for time, or you don't really care, just guess. If you're wrong, just go change your guess. I even remember what one letter things mean. I don't. That's why I'm fixing that. <laughs> um, I I think I remember because this was this is all entity component system ECS, and so to me, like the E is always going to be entity. If I see C, it's going to be component. That's why it was okay abbreviating it. Here, though, it gets a little tricky because I have to remember M stands for movement. But yeah, that's usually component and that's usually entity. I don't need to abbreviate anymore, so I'm not. But I was initially okay with it. Anyway, um, import. So... Yeah, I needed to go for... So it's going to be for every entity in, for every entry in the capabilities array, right? So it's going to be components, capabilities, for capability, right, for, this really shouldn't be capabilities, should it? Oh, no, it should. These are capability components. Yeah, sure. So for capabilities in self dot components dot capabilities, I have a slight slight plural singular problem, but that's okay. Either prof elements one and Fallout Ghost. 
Need to remove caps in the struct as well. Uh, do I? Where do I have caps? Oh, in the struct. I think we're good. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. <laughs> So we're going to end up just executing a database query to, an up, to insert it, right? Insert into capabilities. Three, right? Uh, no, two. Entity and mobility. So it's going to be uh, capabilities dot... Uh, we're inside of a macro, so it's going to be... It's going to give me a hard time expanding that. Entity and component, yep. Capabilities.component.mobility. Well, I called it movement. Okay, this is why we shouldn't have named it M. Because it's actually mo meant to be mobility. <laughs> Not movement. Unable to insert capabilities component. Alright, so that's it for import. Now for export. Export components. Self export components db function export components. I actually waited to start the stream until my son was done playing the flute, and now he's starting to play the flute again. I think I got you baited. So that deserves a. There's no flute emote. Oh well. Jabated. Yep. So if you hear the flute in the background, it's because my son jabated me, thinking that he was done with his music class, and he wasn't. Peepo flute. Uh, I don't have that enabled. Okay, so this should be... Components. This one. And that has, oh, I've, this is the wrong class, or type, that type. That's just capabilities. Okay, I'm just filling in some, why did my, why did I have a multi-cursor there? Capabilities, vec new for now, right? Should make it okay. All right. You can have BTTV, yeah, I've added some, but I haven't added all of them. I should get, like, a list of the ones people want me to add. The Pride one, that's a Twitch one, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this one... Don't want a sub-function to do this, probably because this is going to get really busy, right? So this, let's just make this self-export capabilities. DB, question mark. But I can um, delegate it to yet another level here. So this level is capabilities. And that has a component and entity. And this makes a vector of them. Right, so... I'm going to have to do something like, um, I select, right? Is there a reason why I split this one? Oh, right, because this turned into a while let. That was for a different reason, though. Yeah, okay, so I, I don't want to copy from that. I want to copy from what I did for, like, Players or something like her <laughs> nail. Yeah, like one of these. Just select from the database and collect. That's what we're gonna do, right? Select all from capabilities. There's no where clause. Uh, order by entity, ent right? Hey there, Radon90. How are you today? 
And Muscovish. Is that the one I should add? Okay. I got to log in to add it to mine. Let me do that later. Add later. Add BTT emote. We'll do that. Thank you, Muscavish. I missed some chat, it looks like. Missed some chat. What happened there? Tentepi, hello. I missed Gatu's chat. What's going on with my chat that I'm missing some? I missed chat from Cthulhu, but I don't see it at all. Oh, there it was. Oh, it looked like it came from someone else. Hey there, Cthulhu. Sorry about that. I missed your chat. And Javico, I missed as well. Oh, I missed a bunch of people. Feels bad, man. Right, with the flute emote, yes. Fallout Ghost. As well, yep. We were actually talking, and I... Forgot to wave. And prof elements. I even said hi, and I didn't do the hi emote somehow. All right. There, I've made amends. <laughs> yeah, I even commented on it. I don't know. What's going on? Maybe I should, like, stop doing the individual waves because I'm just embarrassing myself. Unbelievable, I know. Okay, so... This should just be um, context, simpler, right? Context, unable to uh, read capabilities. Components. Capabilities components. Query and then uh, the, what we get back is entity and mobility, right? We don't need parameters here, so that's Rust, Qlite, no params. Okay, I've written this before. Where was it? All right, it was here. No parameters, and then I expect parameterless query should not fail. Okay, so the two things we're getting are, and we have to parse, are the um, entity ID and the... Uh, Component. Well, mo mobilities. Mobilities. So it's uh, entity. Mobility, right? Entity and mobility. For now. If I add more columns, they're going to go inside of here. I think. Actually, there's no reason for... Oh, no. This is structured to match the JSON, right? So here I did have a sub-object for that. In the database, I reasoned that I didn't actually need that. Capabilities. Right, so component is capabilities component with mobility in it. Um, the other, this one's the entity. All right, so select from the database everything from capabilities, order by entity, so I get the nice order here, or they're sorted. This is if the database statement fails. If it doesn't fail, then we're doing a query with no parameters, and then with the row, getting individual columns. These contexts are if they couldn't be parsed, like, the, like if I have a mis mismatch between the type here and the type in the database. Um, this expect is because the um, you this the query and then can throw an error if um, if it couldn't bind parameters, but we didn't have parameters, so it shouldn't fail. Then um, this will go um, f for each row because this gives us an iterator. So for each row, we get a bunch of columns, and we're mapping those columns to. Um, the structure that we want. So taking the entity and mobility columns, putting it into this kind of sort of structure. So you can kind of see how we're 
we're reading out rows and then columns from every row and then from all of that we're forming the structure that matches the JSON here. I have an error here probably because I didn't borrow. Alright, so now I can test it. So here's the command line to import. So I'm importing from an existing test environment snapshot and ticket system and then I can look at it in the database or I can just immediately export it back out and compare the input and the output. Push mark and the closure in and then would return none to and then trigger the expect. Yeah, it's a little convoluted because of the Rusky Lite API, but um, where was it again? I am confused. Oh, down here, right? This in the closure here because it might make more sense if I to toggle inlay hints and show this. Um, what we get back out is a result. So that's why we need this expect here to, to, to handle this outer result. But this end then rows is an iterator that yields um, its own result with the columns in it. So... Um, when we map, we're mapping a result that could be an error. So, um, and this collect turns a, um, it's one of the things that, that uh, I always forget is that you can call collect on an iteration of results and it will um, give you a result of a collection and stop early if it's an error, which is kind of cool, right? So basically if any of these fail, it fail. It'll it'll be caught in this collect, and it'll stop, and then and then the error will go in the position of of this outer result. So let's let's see if that matches what you said. The question mark and the closure in, and then would return none to end then and trigger the expect. Oh, that would be this expect goes with this result here. That's if the qu qu parameter binding fails. Parameter binding won't fail for no parameters. So that's the outer result, but these, these inner results are collected and put into this outer position there. So you were right about the, in, the intermediate result if the parameter binding fails. There's like multiple ways this could fail, right? It could, this expect is if the parameter binding fails, which it shouldn't, which is why I use an expect. This question mark here is if the um, prepare fails, and the prepare will fail if the um, statement, had, if I had to put a syntax error in here somewhere. This will fail. Um, and then any of these individual, like, parsing of the columns could fail if the type doesn't match, which is handled by, which is detected by the collect and put into the final result. I'm being serenaded by very loud flute music, if you can't tell. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it's pretty complex because there are multiple places where the, the, you can get errors when you're dealing with the, the database and the fact that we're essentially compiling this at runtime. Yeah, if my, one of my other kids were to start playing the drums, then we'd have a full concert, right? <laughs> All right, I was going to test this, right? Oh, shoot. Missing field. Okay, so I must have made a mistake in the migration thing. Wait, what? Missing field capabilities. Oh, it got renamed, right? Yeah, I forgot the rename. Uh, it's caps, right? Yeah, I forgot the rename. Caps. If it's different in the JSON than it is in Rust, we have to tell Serity about it. You like using SQLX for the compile time checks? Yeah, that was discussed on your stream earlier, right, Mr. Halsey? I haven't uh, taken a look at it yet, but I want to do that. Maybe I'll learn something from there. And um, before I get too far into this, maybe I, maybe something like SQLX would work work better for me as an as an upper layer for me. It was someone asked about ORMs, right? Shout out to Mr. Halsey, by the way. If you don't watch his stream, you should. He's also doing Rust. With Godot, making games. Yeah, mostly about async. But 
The discussion about Orm is like, hmm, I'm making my own Orm by, from scratch, aren't I? Maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, the Orm discussion. This is an object relational model, right? Because these are objects, right? This is the relational database scheme for that. And then this, the code around here is the, is the mapping between those, these objects and the relational tables, right? So I do my own ORM. <laughs> okay. So the import ran, let me do the export. Yeah. So it goes back to JSON with the export and we can look at the inter intermediate, but here, yeah. So that should be the same as that. Although, um, it was, it went vertical. But I think it's the same data, right? All the M's are ones, and we just have the 523. Yeah, so the data is all there. And if we wanted to, I have a neat little plugin that I use to actually look at the database. Game DB, right click and do open database. And then I can go down here and say, like, capabilities. And it shows them right here. Look at that. If you're wondering what plugin I use for that, it's this SQLite extension here. So you can open databases. You can also do queries. Hashtag add. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, capabilities are all there. I don't know why it opens it on, on its own side, but yeah. Didn't know that extension existed. Yeah, it's pretty dang convenient because I can look, I can look at the schema to make sure that it's what I want. And I can also do quick queries. Like here's all my globals, right? Or I can say, uh, let me do a new select, new select. So let's select, um, just, uh, I forget what my keys are. <laughs> Cheat index, select index. Oh, sorry. It's select value from globals where key equals index, right? And then control shift Q does the query. So there's the result. So pretty dang handy. Okay. Let's go ahead and close that for now. So that's capabilities. One down. 20 something to go. <laughs> Do character next? Here's a more uh, challenging one, right? Actually, not that much. Let's start with the schema. I'll um, pin this one so I don't lose it again. So character used container and container inventory because some characters have, uh, cause the character has their bag, right? Oh, maybe not. Oh, container separate. Okay. So character is easy. It's just one table. Let's pull on that table, fix it up a little bit right here. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. So we don't need these double quotes from C++, do we? Comma becomes a semicolon. Let's spell out the word entity. Let's, um, snake case both of these. All right. looks good to me. So then let's add it to the JSON structure. Here, no, here, right? Do we need to rename it? Character. Character, I don't think we need to rename it. Pub character, vec character. And I know I have singular plural issues, singular plural issues all over the place. I, I think I'm just going to handle that during refactoring. Character. So what's the character got in it? It's got all these things. Why retype them when I can copy paste, right? Just saying, but Rymo8352 would have rhymed you. Good point, but I didn't get to pick that number. Discord picked it. The Discord screwed me over from an opportunity to have a rhyme. <laughs> okay. 
all of these, please. Actually, not that one. Get rid of that comma. U32, I suppose. Just a bunch of numbers, which makes sense. Those are all numerical values, right? When you're making a Unicode character, and how many hit points would it have? Oh. <laughs> this is a game character. Come on. <laughs> Unicode is not a game character. All right. Import first, right? So this is just going to be more copy-paste. Making me think that I should have broken up import into other methods as well. Should I do that proactively here so this doesn't get really... It's going to be insanely long here if I don't. In a minute. Let me put the, fill this in first. So, um... Character. For character in character components, insert into character values. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. Four more. This is going to be, get a little tedious. Actually, let's leverage copy-paste as much as possible here. One word over, end of line, comma. And then character dot in front. That's it for import. Now for export. Character, self export character, db. So. The fact that I'm copy pasting this is a hint that I could maybe do a bit of either macro or you know generic programming here, but I'm not going to try to be that smart right away. I'll probably come back to this if I have an idea about how to do this with macros or generic programming. Right, so then we have, um, I said there are eight, right? Eight columns. And again, having to tediously type all these numbers in, yeah, it might get to me. Uh, these should just all say character, right? Which means these up here should, should have said capabilities. Constitution. Dexterity. Hit points. Max hit points. That's okay, I type reasonably fast, right? I could also just do copy-paste if I feel like it. And then, yeah, I'm not going to type them again. I'm going to copy-paste them. Actually, yeah, it'd be easier to copy-paste from character component, wouldn't it? From character up here. Ah, uh, it's, about, it's about the same. It's about the same. Thank you for the follows. One word over, then to the end of line, comma. And then I have to put all of those words up here. Like that. And the type was character, right? So this level goes away. Yep. Yeah, it's a bit vertical. That's okay. I was thinking earlier today that the differences between like the, that type and this type are just the name, the number of columns, the names of the columns that I want to appear in deep in um, error messages, and the names that they appear in the type itself. So all of that could be put into a macro theoretically. Nothing wrong with vertical, make those get diffs easier. I guess, hey there, Anna Kim Luke. I guess, but then like a lot of this is boilerplate that if I was really smart about it, I might be able to make my own derive macro for this. Like derive export, right? Imagine if I had an export there. 
and then it just generated the code that I need down here to do export character, right? That would be kind of cool. The final map, the derive more crate could help. Final map. Oh, this one? Yeah, I was thinking about that yesterday too, that there ought to be somewhat generic way to do this, that given a large tuple like that, that you can just, if the elements of the tuple were just the fields of a structure, you should be able to say like map to construct a type, like you could map tuple character. Something like that could just do it for me, or maybe with a macro. Because a macro could parse the fields of this type, right? If I did it in a derive. And so it could it could extract these names from the structure itself, right? And yeah, those are all smarter ways that I'm sure the crate derive more or maybe uh, just learning more, practicing with macros could, have, could do it for me. These are all great ideas I will give points for. Probably come back and refactor this later. As you can tell, I'm not going to jump into things that I'm not comfortable with yet, but like, if I were to do this with more comfort in those things, I'd probably do it right away at the start, but yeah, not, not yet. Not ready for that yet. Okay, I said I wanted to refactor the import first. Let me first um, run it to make sure it's still working. So we're going to do an export and an import and then an export. Make sure the data gets through. Okay, missing entity. Oh, there's a rename for that. Yep. There is a rename. That's E, right? That's that E there. Armor. Oh, right. Some of these are optional. Options become nuns. So... Actually, all of these had armor. Which which one did it complain about? Line 29? I don't get it. Column 17. Oh, it's nested one level down. Shoot. I didn't do it right then. I needed to do it like I did it with um, capabilities. I needed to do it this way. This is a character component. I'm surprised I made that mistake. Because I should have just like saw what I did what for capabilities and said, I need to do the same thing there. So yeah, this, yeah. And when, that another hint was that the co code that I copied was correct before and now it's not correct. So yeah, this is character entity component is character component, which has the rest in there, right? Same thing here, right? So, um, character dot, well, they're all here, right? Yeah. All right. Third time's the charm. They become nuns, yeah. But not spelled like that. Nun in Rust will be a null in SQLite. SQLite. Constitution. Oh, that's renamed too. A lot of these are renamed. And then, and actually, okay, there, there's where it will be optional. Some things don't have constitution. Okay, so two different things. Some of these get renamed, and then also some of them are optional. So it looks like armor is always required for a character, but constitution is not. I guess that's because I said constitution would be only for a player character and not a monster. So monsters have dexterity, hit points, and max, but nothing else. Con. Dex. HP. Can't type today. HP max. Int and, and str. 
And then some of these are optional, right? So option. So that can be a none. All these can be none. Dexterity, so it's these two are optional. Cool thing about it is just changing the type here is all I need to all I should need to do because Rust will is using a lot of generics that it should adapt to the difference in type. So import export looks like it worked. Let's look. So there are only character components. Actually, they look the same. Look the same to me. I think it worked. Oh, right. There's another thing we can do to get rid of these n explicit nulls in the JSON. There's a trick for that. There was a trick for that. Was it in tickets, I think, I used it? Yeah. Skip serializing if option is none. That's what we want to do. Here. So don't serialize it if it's none. Bugs you that HP is in the middle of the attributes? I think it is purely alphabetical, yeah. H comes after D and I, so... I'm ordering it the same in Rust so that it it's easy for me to diff the original JSON and the re-exported one to make sure that no data got lost. If I sorted them differently here, it would be hard to do a diff and uh, see that they're the same, right? But in the end, I can put them in any order I want in the database here. So like if you didn't want to see hit points here, I could move it up. There's, I could put it there. Just now I have to make sure that um, S the SQL is um, when you do a values or a star in the SQL syntax, it's order sensitive. So if, because of that star here, hit points is row four by definition. It gets a little tricky there. I could be explicit and say like select armor, hit points, etc. But I think it just makes it a little bit too verbose and I'm willing to I'm willing to have a little bit of coupling between these magic numbers and this because I'm only going to write it once. Um, this code gets frozen after I do the import, right? Um, I can do further migrations to resort, to put the columns in a different order later. Will your bag of holding still work? It should. Bags, bags are containers. Containers can have any number of slots. You just have the more um, slots you have in the container, the, the, uh, the more rows you'll have in this table <laughs> for your bags entity. Okay, so that matched, right? Oh, no, I didn't run it again. Uh, I wanted to see that um, we get rid of those nulls. Okay, we did. So the, the, the nulls are missing from there. So it should match. Should I do a diff? Select for compare. Compare with selected. And scroll down to characters okay it was actually at the very beginning here oh it didn't match it up right it matched up the wrong tables that's unfortunate yeah because this is all in one um it's kind of hard to see but chad is blocking it i get rid of that this is all one component per line, but here it made it more vertical and it matched it up wrong. That's unfortunate. Oh well. Side by side comparison. And then maybe make this shallower. Yeah, okay. So it looks the same to me. Go one page down page down. Okay, it's not lining them up perfectly, but it looks close enough to me. Okay, we're good. It's that weird scrolling that's going on there. 
You see that? I'm not doing anything. I'm not touching anything. It's just scrolling like a marquee all the way to the left. Wacky. What is that? Like a ghost. Like an old phone. Okay, we're done with character. We, we're on a roll? No, I'm uh, not on a roll. I need to refactor. I said I would do it. I need to go do it. So the import needs to... I need to extract some methods here, right? Yeah. So let's have one for the temporary entities. So this is import temporary entities. P uh, function import temporary entities. Something. Um, just want to paste there before I lose my clipboard. And then... Um, believe I used that same syntax. Okay. Oh. The, oh. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Oh, this needs an okay nothing at the end. Yeah. Okay, and then we just call it up here. And then delete all the code. Yay. Hey there, Everix. How are you doing? Doing Rust database stuff today with RustQLite. Okay, capabilities is the second thing. So let's just plop that code here. And this is much the same. Again, this, I feel like I ought to, like, at some point, just make a macro to generate all this code. Because it's all the same except for the names of things, names of tables. Okay, what did I do wrong? Oh, the name. This is insert import um, capabilities. Yeah, and then up here, self.import capabilities database question mark semicolon. Boom, 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 done. Hey there, Monsieur Abadia. How are you doing? No updates to Rust and Analyzer recently. I didn't see any changes to Rust Analyzer. Mine still says one month ago. I'm waiting for them to fix the bug that got in at 408. They introduced a bug that really annoys me. It has to do with their parsing of macros. And so I'm stuck to 02400, the, the version right before the bug, until they fix it. I did update to Rust C 1.51 today, and I got a bunch of new lints that I worked. You like the this bit? I don't really like it because I have to make sure there are as many question marks as there are parameters. Um, again, I feel that this ought to be all macro-generated code. It should be able to generate all that code based off of the type that we're exporting, this, this type here. I should be able to say export and it just just generate the code for me. I'm just not competent and and confident enough in my know how to do procedural macros to do it yet. But I'll probably I'll probably come back here and make a stab at it. I'll make the procedural macro and then I'll see if I can use it instead of this code and then just drop this old code. Is it a prepared statement though and helps protect against Yeah, that's what those question marks are for. So if someone put uh, try to do an injection like try to put a semicolon, no, end parentheses, semicolon, drop drop everything from database in, in here, it won't work because it would quote the thing. In this case, though, these are all integers, so when, but, when do that, but it's still it's still a good practice to put your, use parameter substitution there. Change log? I'll take a look at that later. Thank you, Everex. Give you a point. Looks go, so good when they're back to back. Your security team thanks you, yeah. Your security will thank you when you use parameter substitution like that. <laughs> yeah, you don't want little bobby tables to drop the drop the database. Yep. You know how those analyzer updates get into VS Code? It's I think it's through this Rust analyzer plugin. I have to wait until they um, publish a new version, I suppose. I, that's okay. I'm I can be patient. Okay, we have one more here, right? Character. Import characters. 
import character. And I know I have a singular plural issue. You know, that's okay. We'll fix that later. That goes there with an okay at the end. And then really I'm just extracting functions at this point. So that it, at the top level it's easy to read. So when we add something new here, we just add another func function call and a function here. And if we want to make it less clutter, we can just collapse these and see that our import consists of one global variable, which I could extract another method if I wanted, uh, and then three different sub-function calls, and that's our import. Export similarly, sort of inside out. We're constructing one thing by uh, decomposing into three things, which are all right here which I could then close those up, and it should look a lot nicer. Oh, there are four, not three. Oh, because this unfolds to two more. This one and this one. Yeah. Not quite symmetrical, but that's okay. So then, um, test this. Make sure I didn't break anything. Okay, and then look at the snapshot again. It doesn't look like I broke anything. I don't like how vertical it is. Looks good to me. All right, I'm going to check this in saying we added capabilities and components. You don't actually need the nightly channel. They have releases very often if you check there. I don't know what channel I'm on for extensions. I think I'm on stable or, or something like that. Uh, I forget where you check for that. But it might be that I'm just not getting them quick because I'm picking a channel that doesn't give me the updates very frequently. Yeah, you might be on the nightly channel and I'm not on the nightly channel. I don't remember. So, yeah. I mean, I'm on... The, the latest I can get is 481, so it depends on um, how current 481 is. If there's something newer than that that I'm not getting, it might be because I'm just not on a aggressive enough channel. I did a bunch of other things before the stream to make some of these things keys that should be. Maybe I should have that in a separate um, commit pre-stream work. So this was just... Um, make some db columns keys that should be because there's no reason them not to okay that i don't want to check in that's just what a uh, side effect of the export tool okay so add it here, here we go so add capabilities and character components Commit that. All right. Next. What do we have next? Container. Okay, here's all the bags, right? So this is a little bit more complicated because the com each container has a description, but then it also there's also a nested table. So we'll have two tables, right? The, the container is really just its description, and then th there'll be container items. So when C++ I did it here with container and container inventory. So I think we just want to leverage that previous work, not have to think about the design so much, just kind of pull it in, right? So paste, indent. Your available version are very off compared to VS Code plugin? Yeah, I wonder why. So I don't know why. Null, 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 no. Where'd you see a quadruple null? Did five releases in March? I don't know. Do I need to maybe just check for updates here? Oh, that's always a bad idea, though. It's downloading an update. It might be because my VS Code is out of date. <laughs> and now I just did it live on stream, and I'm going to be very unhappy when it breaks. That's okay. We we can handle it. We've been there before, chat. Okay. These are both entity, right? 
All right, I think those look pretty clean. Description, open flag, element. Oh, I think I can give a better name for that, right? In here, it was item. I think I called it element because I had some generic code that dealt with it. Maybe I want to keep it element because I might want to re to apply some kind of generic code to tables like that. Okay, let's keep that. Updating VS Code, the stream, I know. Uh-oh. Okay, well, YOLO. <laughs> Restarting. Installing Visual Studio Code on my comp computer. Please wait. Please wait while it installs it. In before stream crashes. All right, we're on February 2021. Exactly. What's that emote? Sus boom. There used to we used to use Adam Nuke, but Adam got rid of um, all of the subscriptions to his channel except for his own, so we can't use Adam Nuke anymore. Oh, we got a bunch of things. I don't really care about reading them through them now, but let's see. What plugin updates do we have? The Git Lens updated. I don't know why I have this plugin. I have no idea what it is. Prettier got updated. Python got updated. Rust Analyzer can go to 538. All right, there you go. Yep, there have been several. Okay, one is just one hour ago. Dare I update? Dare I? I dare. Updating. Reload. YOLO. Jupiter is a dependency of Python. Okay, that might explain why I have it then. I dare. Yes, we can always go back. Okay, downloading. So the test would be, do I get false positives on um, some of the macros that I used to use um, for like, like, um, I guess I could just manually jump to it. Like in my, where is it? Where are these things open? Web sockets, source, lib, I think. No, web socket. Um, Feature select. Yep, here we go. This is a false positive. It says unresolved macro call, right? So they still haven't fixed the bug. Feels bad, man. We have a Raimu 8 fail, we have a feels bad man, we even have a Pepe hands. Which means if I don't want to see that, which is annoying to me because it's not really an error, I have to go all the effing way back to 400, which is now three months old. It's interesting it didn't have me reload. Thank you for the follow. See, so yeah, if you two see uh, Rust Analyzer false positives on bugs when it has to do with some macros, you might have to go back to... You might have to go back to 0 0.2.400 to fix that for now. I sh guess I should be happy that it still works. If... If this, if 400 gets so old that it doesn't work with the latest Rust at some point, I'll have to update, and then I'll have to deal with those false positives. And some, one of you guys gave me a workaround that I haven't tried yet. That's another option, that I could update to the latest, but then apply the workaround. Um, it's an issue with parsing macros in Rust Analyzer, and there was, yeah, there was some way to disable the parsing. But then, I didn't do it at the time because I didn't feel like, there's a trade-off there, right? Is it, do you want false positives, or do you want it not to catch any mistakes at all? It's like, well, I do want it to catch, like, if I had a real mistake here, like X, right? So it'll catch that. See, it says, it says it's a, I expected an arrow, right? Now, there's a way to, like, overcome the false positive of the macro just by telling Rust, Rust Analyzer not to go into macros, and then it wouldn't catch that at all. So I opted to, like, yeah, sure. I want it to catch legitimate things, and I don't want it to do false negatives, so I'll just stick to an old version. But if I had to, I'd update to the latest, and I'd probably disable Rust Analyzer looking into any macros. It already has problems, right? I can't control-click anything here. You can't control-click 
control left click anything because it's Rust Qlite doesn't really dive direct fully down into the syntax of a macro. I can control click outside of a macro just fine. Any of these things I can control click on to see the definition. Can't do that inside a macro, which does annoy me. Anyway, we tried it. We gave it. We gave it a chance, and it didn't work. So, <laughs> moving on. I'm patient. I can I can wait another three months. I can maybe even wait six months. You can wait until it breaks for some other reason, then I'll move. <laughs> okay, I'll allow that, Marco Dev. But I'm gonna assume that you forgot to put the kappa on the end of your statement. It's not Rust that's the problem, it's Rust Analyzer. It's a shortcoming of the plugin. What was the proposed fix? The, I don't know if there was a proposed fix. There was a proposed workaround, which was to just disable the um, Rust analyzer even doing anything with the macros. Thank you, MarcoDev. Yeah, so the workaround is to just have Rust analyzer not look into it at all. And I'll do that as a, like a last resort if I really need to update to the latest, I think. Okay, um, next, right? Next component, container, right, let's do it. Let's make the JSON for container. This is gonna get quite big, right? I'm wondering if I should make a subfolder for the different kinds of components. Actually, I think I will because this is gonna get quite large, right? Because we're gonna have all of these other types of components. It's just going to pollute the namespace. Let's let's break it up now. So we'll have a components folder, and inside of there we'll put character dot rs, and then from components we'll do a mod up here, character, and then I'm going to move character component and character in there. All right, I did that. So back up here. Um, we'll have to do a control dot to import it. I don't know why it adds a self. Does it really need the self? I guess it doesn't technically need it, but the self makes it unambiguous that it's going into our own module called character. So maybe I'll keep it. All right. All right, and because of this needing to be pub, this will need to be Pub. Oh, right. It already is, but there's some syntax errors. We need the, um, the pull in the 30 definitions. All right. So back to working now. I think I'll also pull out the import character. I think I can do this. Not entirely sure, but let's try. I think I can do an impl game snapshot components here and add I might not be able to do this but let's see I think I just need to do an import here right import super yeah and then um, pull in rustqlite params and we should be good right so there we go we've broken up oh no I also need context use anyhow context as we don't want its name, we just want its side effect. And then I need to, oh, is this a problem? Oh, it's private. So I just need to make it public from this module. So there we go. Beautiful. What's the syntax error here? What's wrong? Oh, yeah, import that. Okay, so let's do the same thing with uh, capabilities. So a new file here, capabilities. So that's another mod, capabilities. And capabilities and its subcomponent, capabilities component get moved out. Moved over to capabilities. We'll need uh, 30 and, and other stuff. Let's just pull in what we need for now. We'll do another impl game snapshot components, which we'll need to import from super. 
and import capabilities. Oh, I should pull them. I should also take the export ones too, right? And then make that public. I need params. Use Rust Qlite params and context. Use anyhow context as underscore. And then just pull them in with uses, import self capabilities, all that good stuff. Cool. Hey there, Resubaka. Is that going too fast for anybody there? I was basically pulling out some of the code from this file into a subcomponent. So this one's just the capability stuff. This one's just the character stuff. So that the parent one can be relatively clean. So I can move out the exports as well. So export capabilities can move down to capabilities, right? Just moving stuff around. I think it's really cool that you can do this in Rust, that I can basically have this impl in three different places, right? So there's impl games snapshot components in three places. I don't know any other language that will let me do that. Hey there, Great Jack. I'm doing okay, but it makes sense to implement an import trait for the component types. If I wanted uniformity to their syntax, yeah. So I could do that. It really just enforces the convention. I don't wouldn't need it for trade objects, right? It would just use it for well, I could use that if I were to start to do things like um have um like a macro generate the code, right? Well, no. Macro wouldn't even need it. I would I would I would really need to trade if it became an API that I published. In in this where we're using it here, it's all internal though, right? It's not actually exposed. The um the um like when we use uh where is it? When I use um the self stuff, none of this is pub. None of these are marked pub, so they don't escape this module, so there's no AP there's no needed an API to it is not needed. And so um the usefulness of the trait goes down, right? You a trait becomes useful when you expose it in an API and you give it to other people who don't need, you don't want them or you, they don't need to know the details. They just need some kind of abstraction. So a trait becomes the abstraction and I don't really need an abstraction here. It's just a convention that they all take the DB as an argument and they return an anyhow result. So the trait would just enforce this convention is all it would do for me. It wouldn't be useful as an abstraction layer for me. I hope that makes sense. I could still do it as a demonstration. There's no harm in it, right? It would require me moving these functions to these structs, whereas right now they are implemented on the parent and not directly on the struct. It would also require that I um, write this is a vector of them. So I would have to implement it for a vector, right? I guess that would be part of the trait. The trait would be on, would be implemented by the, the trait would have implementations for the vector of T, where T is that trait. Yeah, so I could do it as an exercise. It might be kind of fun. I might do that. Then if I ever do want to expose that to the API, it would become useful so that like, so you could plug in a new kind of component and not have to change this code, for example. So there might might be uses for that. Um, but let me finish what I was doing. I have import and export for that, but not cap, but not um character, right? Yeah, this one. Right, Char character needs to move or to here, and that needs to become public from this module to its parent, and then we would need to import them. Oh, that's because it's not pub. All right. Okay, we don't need those uses after all because they're handled in the sub sub module. Okay, maybe do the same thing with temporary entities. Then it'll be it'll it'll make the parent module really clean, which is a, a nice goal to have, right? Temporaries. Just call it temporaries. I can name it whatever I want, right? Mod temporaries. 
Okay, so that's this one here. Temporary paste. We need the CRD macros. We need hash set. Okay, and then import. All right, and then the functions themselves. So that's one. So impl game components, game snapshot components, paste, make it public. Whoa. <laughs> I switched desktops by hitting the wrong key there. <laughs> you got to see my background for a while. Yeah, I created another desktop. Let's delete that desktop. All right. <laughs> That's when my hand slips and I accidentally hit Windows D or win Windows tab instead of Alt uh, Control tab. I'm very sloppy on the keyboard sometimes. Okay, the same things, right? Use Rust QLite params. Use anyhow context as underscore. All right, and then uh, then this doesn't need RustQLI params. Okay, and then the export function we can move as well. Pub. Hash map needs to be imported. How are we looking there? Looking good. So now it's down to 70 lines. This is awesome, right? Get rid of these two. So we just have the outermost shell and we have a line for every import and a line for every export. Or, well, it's broken between the temporary entities is, is in the outer level and the inner level has everything else in it. And let me pe catch up on chat here. Oh, if you're curious about what temper, what these temporary entities are, these right now are only admin cameras. The idea is that when I log in as an admin, I need an entity to exist for the admin as the admin's camera because the admin doesn't actually control a real character. So um, if the admin camera was a permanent entity, I wouldn't need the temporary entities category at all. Um, so an alternate way to, to do this would be to have the admin entity be persistent and so whenever you connect as an admin, now you're looking through their, the camera, which is permanent. But I said, like, I didn't want really the admin to have a permanent entity. The, when the admin logs out, I wanted it to automatically, like, clean up any resources the admin might have been consuming. So those are what I'm calling temporary entities. So at, the, at some point, the last time I, looked, I was using the game, I must have had two different admin cameras on a particular server for a particular connection. And then when the snapshot was created, it recorded that. One property of temporary entities is they are automatically deleted if the server-client combination no longer exists. So the next time this would be deserialized and the game loaded again, it would just delete them immediately. The Windows Shake one is the one you do by accident. I, so I do the alt the window tab all the time, <laughs> and it's always disruptive to me. I'm like, whoa, everything just disappeared. Where did it go? Because in Windows that you can swap desktops that way, and it's like a feature I didn't even know about. All right, so this being nice and clean, let me um, build it one more time. Oh, and I lost my terminal because I restarted. So I got to type this from scratch. Cargo run bin game state JSON dash 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 s path to game snapshot dash t is the ticketing system. Import. So that imports from the last snapshot and tickets for the test version, test um, environment of the game, and then export just blats them back out to the current working directory. So that should be out here. Game snapshot. So we yeah, got caps and character that didn't get changed at all. I haven't looked at tickets in a while, but yeah, it looks set, looks fine. Don't need to keep that open. Config should be fine too. All right. 
So well, this that was a refactoring step. So refactor refactoring of um, game state JSON. This we don't want. These we do. Oh, and I was in the middle of adding that. Okay, we're not gonna check. We're not gonna check that one. And I added that, and then I forgot I was gonna go back in and refactor this stuff first. So this gets staged, right? This does not. This is the refactoring. So those are all new files. This is the file that changed because we now have modules. So mostly deleted code. Okay. So this would be extract different types of components, component import, export um, into their own, own sub-modules. Commit that. All right, so next was going to be containers. That's bags and chests and stuff like that. Good night, Nui. Already? I've only been streaming an hour and a half. I must have started really late. Yeah, I think I did. Shake harder, that's right. What is on me, Arania? I'm glad you asked that, Master Lich. Hello, welcome to the stream. On me, Arania is the game that I've been working on. The, you can see the production environment now just by going to that link. I'll show you what it looks like from an admin point of view. I have a whole bunch of extra tabs here. I can edit the world. I can do all sorts of things. So it's a game modeled after Ultima 4, Ultima 5, that genre of game from the, from the 1980s. So it's pretty retro. It's old. It's going to be mostly text-based, but with a little bit of graphics just to show the, the tile art of like where you are in the game world, where everyone else is, that kind of thing. And... Um, it's all mostly from scratch. The production environment is front end is in React, Redux, and Phaser JavaScript libraries. And the code I wrote on top of that. And then the back end is all in C++, mostly custom. Um, since last July or so, I decided I'd rewrite it all in Rust after I learned the Rust programming language. So that's what I've been doing for a few months now. The goal right now is to get the game back up to the level it was in production but all in Rust, and then continue the game dev. So um, for for probably the next six months, I'll still be doing the uh, conversion to Rust. So the stream is mostly, at this point, a rehash of what I did the last couple of years, but doing it in Rust so that we're learning, th like how do we do the same things that we did before in C++ and JavaScript, but doing it in Rust instead. And... Um, also, it's an opportunity for improvement. So what I'm working on today is all of the the game's save file, so to speak, in the past has been stored in huge JSON files. So just in the test environment alone, it's 11,000 line long JSON file. Most of it's in the entity component system. So things like uh, here are all the doors in the game world, right? Where they um, Not where they are, but whether they're locked or open or closed and that kind of thing. Where they are would be the same entity, but the position component, right? the coordinates of things in the wor world. So this is all one huge JSON file. It was really inefficient and slow to load and save. So we're taking the opportunity while we're converting to Rust to also convert this data to a database. So that same information we're going to put into this database in SQLite. So things uh, w I just showed like door and position will be in here soon. But right now, um, it only has the tables we've converted so far. So the one we just did was, um, it was character, right? I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing character. Did I not run it? I didn't. Maybe it's because I didn't run it yet. I'm looking. No, I'm looking at the wrong in the wrong place. Sorry. So close that. <laughs> I got to go to the top level. Thank you for the follows, by the way. At the top level, game database, open database. We should see. Yeah, here character. So here's um, the, all of the um, different characters in the. Um, game in the test environment there aren't very many it's probably just my character i think this one is that guard that you that you saw and then they're like a whole bunch of slimes and this is just the part of those entities that had to do with what makes them a character as opposed to being something else like an inanimate object like an item so like they're everything 
uh, in that you can see in the game world has a position, whether it's a character or not. So the position data of each character is stored in a separate table. We haven't gotten to that. The only thing that'll be in the character table per se is things that are only characters have. Like only characters have armor, constitution, hit points, that kind of thing. So um, this was formerly stored like this in a big as part of a huge JSON file. So it's going to be a lot more efficient to update, to read, and and write as a database because we let the database do what it's designed to do, which is very efficient inserts deletes updates all that stuff and um it's a, as opposed to this unwieldy huge monolith <laughs> so that's what i'm working on today it's past midnight there Nui. I, it makes sense that you'd be going to bed now have a good one so master lich i hope i answered the question i don't mind taking these side discussions they're they're absolutely fine uh from time to time like if i get asked the same thing two or three times in the stream i might just kind of abbreviate and just have you look at it. Um, but yeah. Plus I can go back to my VOD and if like I wanted to, I could extract that clip and make it into a separate YouTube video and then make a link to it. So the next person who asks me, what is it? I could say, Hey, I, I have a great explanation here. Follow this link and, and, and watch it. And you'll, you'll know in like 25 seconds or whatever. And yeah, no problem. So the next component type, was container, right? I, I, I know I'm beating around the bush, but I'll get there. I swear I'll get there. I'm just getting set up here now. Components, right? Okay, close that. Right, I had just refactored, so every single kind of component here will have its own sub-module in the tool to do the import. So we're going to add another one called container. Container or containers? container i want to even though there's like um a singular plural issue here that maybe it should be containers not container i really just want to be consistent with what names i've already been using here so it was caps or capabilities plural and everything else here was singular so we're just going to try to stick stick with that to make it easier on myself i'm just going to copy paste from something else and change the names so this becomes container. All right, now what do we have to change here? Container has, again, the same kind of broken down structure between component and, and entity, right? So there's container component. The component itself has a description and it has items. So that's desk for description, which is a string. And then items, I don't think we need a rename for that one, it's just items, a vector of entity references, right? Which are optional, so it's an option U32. I'm thinking more and more about, what was it, Sarian or someone said, I ought to make a type alias for entity, because I know I'm gonna screw up and say U size or U64 at some point, and then I'll, I won't know it immediately. So I'm, so I'm considering it now more carefully. I think we should do it. So let's call it entity. I will go to the top level and just make the type here. Type entity equals U32. And I think I can just go into here and um, use it. Uh, maybe I need to make it pub. And then I can use it here. How come it won't let me do it? Shouldn't I be able to say, like, use super entity? Thank you for the follows. I appreciate it. Probably should, yeah. Plus ones all around. I wonder why it, it didn't figure that out for me. And why is this giving me a type alias never used problem? I am using it. I'm using it here. Oh, because I don't have the mod declared. That's why. Okay, I need to actually... Type that in order for it to link the two together. There we go. Also means that later if you decide you want some logic on entity, you can make... Yeah, that's true. Then I can make, like, impul entity, right? If I do something like... Um, I'd have to do something like... Um, 
struct entity. That's a new type, right? That's called a new type in Rust. Basically, it is really stored as a 32-bit integer, but it has a new name, and you can have new semantics tied to it. And then something that requires one like this doesn't work directly with the U32. Metro Dev, you didn't have to do that, but thank you very much for the five gifted subs. So that's Red Rampage Crumpet, Lazy Guru, the Primogen, Astonic Coder, and Uber Unix. That's four out of five regulars to the channel, so I appreciate that. It's not stored as the U32 unless you repper transparent. Really? So you're saying this isn't really a U32 unless I do a repper transparent, which I don't even know what that means. So how would this be stored then? That'd be like five bytes, the this plus one byte for the fact that it's that type. To me, it doesn't really, it's not really important. Just having the name as a type alias lets me add that later without having to change it everywhere we use it. So probably is, but Rust doesn't ensure it. Okay, so there's no there's no guarantee, but it probably will be 32 bits because there's no extra information, right? Good to know. There was a question right before the gifted subs. If you decide the same logic, you can make it a new type and and wrapper transparent add methods that should just work, yes. Yep. I think you're right. Although, A squared, you know more about this than I do. So, the question was probably for the experts in chat who might know differently. I, I defer to your knowledge of Rust because you know more and um, would not presume to answer the question myself unless I knew the answer too. Default wrapper without a wrapper backer is not insured. For anything, yeah. Big the big rust brains here are folks like A squared, Sarian, and Musen, who's sometimes here, and others. And basically anyone here who um is in this list that I like to shout out probably knows more Rust than I do. Cause I've only been using Rust for like eight months. Yep. There's that crustacean again. Crustacean? Is that why we use a crab? Because it's a crustacean? Rust? I get it now. New types compile away. Right, they're just extra constraints on a type, right? I figured it out, Jaboko. Jabico? Is it J Jaboko? Or is it Jabico? <laughs> I never stopped to consider that. I might be pronouncing it wrong the whole time. Okay, uh, we're using entity, um, but let me fix the rest of this, and I do need to go back to those other three modules and use entity there, too. Oh, it's Yaboko. Or Yaboko. You tend not to use... Yeah, I wouldn't use a special markup for the representation unless I needed it after at some interface point like foreign function interface, like Mar Mr. Halsey is saying. They're both common, okay. Grumpy wants to change it. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice that. Your names are both in purple. So I thought, I think I'm talking to the same person. <laughs> All right, anyway, I'm getting too distracted. My, my apologies. So import container into, okay, the container doesn't have very many values in it. It just has the description. Oh, and it has an open flag. Okay. It's actually three things. There's the entity, there's the description, and we forgot the open flag. In JSON, it's probably last. That's why I didn't see it. Oh. Wait, it's not even here? Wait. Then why do we have an open flag here? Why is that there? Oh, it's optional. Ah, okay, optional bool. All right, good. And it comes after items. Okay, so this is another advantage to using Rust. I can be very specific about the type. I can say the fact that it's sometimes there and sometimes not means it's an option, right? Option bool. 
Now looking at this, I know the types, the order, and then whether things might be missing. All right, so then it's container dot component dot open. And then export or by entity. So there are three rows. Entity ID description open flag. Right, so that's description, items, and this is where I would want to have a nested call, like self export container items. And then uh, open. And then this is another function, which kind of looks like this function. So it kind of has the same structure like that. Instead of container, it's going to be container inventory. And we'll need to know which container. So I'll want to have like entity here. So we have entity here. Entity. Yay, we can use the actual type. And then... Order by slot, right? And a where clause, entity equals question mark. So I will have a parameter here, entity. And this expect is wrong now. I need something more like what I had for players. Like, yeah, I can, a, context and then early exit unable to bind container or well, entity id id to query right and uh, we don't need column zero we just need column one and two this is the contain container item slot actually i don't even really need the slot number that really just gets order so let's, let's just grab one container item entity right or element container element and because there's only one row here we can do away with the okay and the um, tuple and get rid of the question mark as well and just pass the um, the result in directly so this becomes um, It's not a vector of container, it's, it's a vector of container item. Vector of options of entity, that's what it is. There. And so this becomes a um, map element to... Actually, do I need to map it at all? I don't think I do, it just is an option entity at that point. So I don't need the map, do I? I just collect. I can just collect it. Hey, I think. Uh, this goes here, right? It was um, entity description open. All right, cool. So that that's done. I'm getting uh, compiler errors back in container again. What's going on? Uh, what happened there? Can capabilities, what? Oh, I never added it here. Pub container, vec container. It was named container, right? And we need to make sure these names are the same. That name has to match that name. Import from submodule, good. And then I need it here. Container self export container db question mark. And then we add that. Actually, no, I already have that, right? Yes. What's going on here? That does return a result. What's going on? 
Oh, this doesn't. Um, shoot. What did I do for that? I will peek. Where I have a sub export. What did I do? Ah, right. I use an and then instead of a map. So use an and then. And then I have to wrap the whole thing into an OK in case um, it fails. So it becomes that. Good. Optional option bool. Yeah, it's either open or it's closed. <laughs> it's a bool. Do you typically write your tests for this off stream? No, I typically write them on stream. I just um, am not using test-driven development for this one. Mostly because it's really easy to just import and then export and do a diff. And then also because this is going to be a one-off tool to bootstrap the version 2 of the game. What game date is this? Hey there, Matty Two Shoes. The game is right here. It's all the data for this game if you follow that link. So everything about every account that's been made and every player and monster in the game, all the items, all of the um, information on the tile sets, uh, practically everything is going to be in this database and it was originally in a huge JSON file and we're porting it to a real database so just the test environment alone the JSON was getting 11,000 lines plus it was just too huge so we're porting it why is Keylight? mostly because the game already runs in a replicated cluster and so rather than there being just one copy of the database, every server needs to already have its own copy of all the data. And so when you have one instance having a, uh, what's the right word, a captive audience database, like it's the only client of the database, SQLite becomes attractive because you could do it all in memory if you wanted. You know you only need one connection. No one else is going to connect to it. So you can do away with all the, like, all the other uh, trappings of, of big expensive database might might have to, in order to like handle simultaneous or heavy loads you just need something simple so sqlite is simple and does what i need and doesn't do doesn't have features that i don't need you know something like postgres natively support json well but then i don't want to stick with json i want to move to uh, a more um relational model for something especially things like the ticketing the in-game ticketing system because it, we really are going to have like direct mappings between rows in the database table to a display. And so I'm already doing a lot of clumsy manipulation to get this from JSON into that. So, yeah. Oh, is that the misunderstanding? Yeah, it, it's the entire database. Yes. Yeah, the, the production environment right now is one huge JSON file for, for the serialization and storage of the data. While it's executing, it's not in this JSON format. It's when we store the state of the game to disk, to a save game file. It's all in one huge JSON file. So the big performance hit, I only really realize that when we um, have to start the game server. So if you ever see me start my game servers in production, it's really a painful process where I start it and then I have to wait like a minute or two before to load the entire and parse the entire JSON file. And then it's all in memory and then we're then we're good to go. Yeah, so going relational, I did that for my stream helper, this guy, who I use to like remind myself to say hey. And now I've said hey, so it drops off. This whole thing is the same principle where um, it was really slow to load whenever I'd start my stream because it was all stored in JSON, and so moving it to a SQLite database really sped it up. Sounds a little like GTA's loading. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to avoid that. <laughs> Every AAA game recently, how much memory does it actually use? Not a whole lot. The huge JSON file is mostly spaces and new line characters when you get down to it, and the all these names go away, right? They they're represented in memory just by their structure, right? The names we use when we declare structures don't actually get stored in memory most of the time, right? So like this name could be as long as we want. In memory, we're not storing this name. We're only storing the uh, actual data that goes into the structure. So, and this being a structure of structures, we have to dig down to the very bare, 
the, to the very internal. So like a capabilities component is really just 32 bits for the mobility. So this name mobility, this name capabilities component, not in memory, right? Whereas if when we store it to disk, I have to, um, because of the structural nature like of, of how JSON is defined, we have to give names to every every um, point in the structure. So a lot of space is consumed just by the names and, and, and structure of things. So very inefficient. Do you store things like metrics? Um, I can show you what I did store as far as metrics. So I, show, I store the total amount of time, real time that the game is executed. And then since the server took over, that's the delta time. And then for every server, I was tracking things like the number of logins, the number of counts created overall, actually, also. And then how much um, work. So basically CPU usage. Um, so over this time, this this amount of real time was spent in the C area and the E area. The, the, I think the C stood for coordinator and this is the executor functions of the game because these were the two hot pads that I was worried about. And um, I think sys is the s game systems, the Lua code. So like these are the four hot path areas, so to speak, of the game that I wanted to track. And so I was tracking the amount of real time spent there. But that's about it for metrics. I could probably, should probably track more metrics than I am. <laughs> it's not that it's overwritten. It's that when we load, we initialize a variable to that. And then as we count time, we're adding to it. And then when we want to serialize the state of the game, we just store what we sample and store what we have. Um, but the, in, the, the, the way I wrote the code, another reason it's inefficient is every time we make a snapshot of the game, we rewrite the entire game, even if nothing has changed. So like if the only thing that's changed in the game is the total time, it'll still write every single thing out. Whereas if we were to serialize it to the database, since we know the only thing we changed was the total time, there'll just be an update global variable total time to be that. And then it's much faster. We don't have to rewrite the entire game database. And you look at a historic metric, it might not be possible. Well, yeah, for total time, I don't care. This is just an accumulated total time. For things that I want to keep historical log for, like um, player bands, for example, I'll have a special subtable for that. So, like, um, I think it was called events. Yeah, so this for a player can have these events, right? Every time they get banned and every time they get unbanned, a new thing will get added. So I modeled that in the database by having a special table for that player bands or player events, right? So a new role, a new row gets added for player events every time someone gets banned or unbanned. So anything I want to keep a history of, I'll, I'll probably have a special table where a row gets added whenever something changes, right? But things I don't care about the history of, like just the total time the game's executed, I'll just have an accumulator. And I could change this, right? I can say, oh, okay, now I want to start tracking how much time per day. Then I'd probably make a new subtable for metrics like time per day. But yeah, I will have lost all of the information that we've already destroyed, <laughs> of course. Does SQLite not use any IDs? IDs for what? SQLite has the concept of a row ID, but I haven't needed that yet. Row IDs are just like if you don't have any other ID and you just need something to make the row unique. You might, yeah, I might realize it's too late, but eh, it's okay. <laughs> I can live with not having captured the data I might have wanted to. I can deal with that. I can live with that. I think we were on container, right? Actually, I think I finished it. Should I test that? So rerun the import. We should be pulling in container data now. Oh, wait a minute. That code shouldn't be dead. Okay, there's something wrong because I'm not calling that. That's not being called. It should be called from here. I probably have a placeholder here. Oh, it's just not called. self import container DB question mark. See, that's why we should always listen to the compiler warnings. <laughs> I forgot to call the function. Import and then export. See, I'm, I'm being lazy about my um, unit testing. I'm, I'm just uh, doing a um, import followed by an export and doing a diff. If I wanted to be more follow a better um, discipline here. I probably have a unit test for every bit of code I add. Okay, description might be optional. 
because here's an example of where oh no it's a mismatch on type okay so i maybe i have a copy paste problem it's not an optional column problem container oh wait what was it again description description is oh the row id is wrong <laughs> All right, that would do it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to eyeball the um, diff now. Thank you for the follows. I appreciate it. Here's the original container. I had a cavern stash, which was empty. And then I had a lightning zone stash, which had two things in it. So let's see. And this is the re-export, right? So closing caps and character container cavern stash. Okay, that's wrong. <laughs> I messed up on the items. How about the open? Okay, two things about it. It shouldn't print out a null. It looks like everything else worked, though. Yeah, false, true for the outside box. Okay, so let me fix the open null thing. That's because I forgot to put an attribute on open saying to dis. To disregard it if it's none. Uh, where did I use that? In character? I might have used it. Yeah, skip this whole thing, right? Without the rename. Skip serializing if none. That's one problem. The other one was the items. There was always empty, right? Let's look and see if the if it's in exp if it's in export only, then it should be in the database. See, this is where a unit test would have caught it, but I'm catching it just by, like, inspection of things. Um, it didn't show me anything. Wait, why is this not working? How come that button's not working? Do I have a... Oh, I have a window already open. That's why. All right. Never mind. Okay, so it's not even importing anything, because we should have at least one row. The description is an open or imported correctly, but not the inventory. All right, now we know what the problem is. We lost all the items in the world that are stored in boxes. We could fix that. So that would be import. Oh, yeah, we never did anything with the items. <laughs> uh, we need to do that here, right? For item or element... In, actually, we also need to know the slot number. So slot and element in container.item. Where's it? Components. Items. And we can borrow. No, we don't need to borrow because we we'll say iter enumerate. So for those who don't know, iter takes a collection. In this case, it's a vector. And gives us an iterator that go, walks through the items. And enumerate adds the index of the element to the item itself. So if I didn't have the enumerate, I would just have element. Adding enumerate at the end basically decorates one enumerator with another one. So there's an outer iterator that uses the inner inter iterator to get to the element, but then it also tacks on a number going starting from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If I didn't need to the slot number, I wouldn't use enumerate. And we would just have this. And then there's a little bit of syntactic sugars. If we simply borrow a collection, it presumes that we would just want to iterate it. Right? So that works and just gives me the element. But if I want the slot number two, I have to call enumerate on another iterator, so we have to call iter ourselves. What's your vector, Victor? Roger, Roger. Let's say this is a data analyst, but this is very interesting stuff. Don't let me keep you. Oh, don't worry, Maddie Tissues. I make these side excursions because when there are like, I don't know how many people are watching, but when you get to like 30, 40 people watching or more, when you have a question, there's probably 10 other people who have the same question, but they just don't feel like they want to type out the question for one reason or another. So even if like you don't need the exhaustive answer, there might be like, 10 other people who might have wanted some aspect of the answer and so I try to keep everyone as happy as I can by giving a really 
full answer that maybe you didn't need all of it, but probably someone else might be finding that interesting. Yeah, lur we like lurkers. We, we, we appreciate the lurkers. And everyone who asks the question is doing the lurkers a favor by probably answering, asking a question that some lurker might be interested in. And just, they didn't want to, because they can't ask the question and, and stay a lurker. People like to be lurkers, right? But how can you lurk and ask a question? It's impossible. You, get, you wait until someone else asks the question and then you secretly thank, you have like 10 lurkers thanking you virtually. Uh, they can't tell you thanks because then that would unlurk them. But you, you know what I'm saying. All right, anyway. <laughs> I'm being ridiculous. Insert into container items, right? Is that the name of the table? Uh, where to put it? Up here somewhere. Container inventory. Entity, slot, and element, right? So we know the entity. The slot is slot, and the element is element. Unable to insert container element. Oh, uh, wait, what's wrong? Oh, okay, so one of these is uh, U size. So the error I get here, I know why. It says the trait bound U size RustQLite to SQL is not satisfied. It's a fancy way of Rust saying it doesn't know how to turn the unsigned size type into something RustQLite can use in SQL. And that's a decision the RustQLite folks made because um, there really is no way with SQLite syntax to support a full 64-bit unsigned integer. So we, the compromise is we take that slot and we say as an uh, I size, which is a signed size, and then that fits into SQL. Pass with shades. I like that. All right, so that should fix the import problem with the inventory, right? And probably the export's already there, so export should just work, right? Hoping and praying that just works. There we go. Camera stash is all nulls. Yeah, yeah, lightning stash had those two items in it. Here's those box uh, items in the outside box. Compare with the input, right? Uh, right. These items should be the same as the item. It looks like they are. 40, 500, yep, same items. And they need to be in the same order. That's important. Otherwise, items get shuffled around. Which, if you play any kind of game that has inventory where it's a grid, you would get annoyed if your items got randomly shuffled around on you, wouldn't you? The nulls represent slots in the box that are have no item in them, by the way. Know that this means that there are valid slots that panic when trying to export. Oh no, it, it it should it should be fine. What what do you mean by panic? Because I might not be understanding it correctly, but these nulls are just uh, nuns in Rust. Anything? Oh, 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 right. Yeah, you, we can't have more than two billion items in a bag. Sorry. <laughs> on a 32-bit system. And on a 64-bit system, it's what? Into the quadrillions? Yeah, it'll panic for a ridiculously large number, which we'll probably never have. <laughs> what about the boxes and the boxes and the boxes? Yeah, it'll. this will panic, I think. Right? The as panics if um, on error. It's either going to panic or it's going to um, wrap. But I believe as doesn't wrap, it just panics. Yeah, I think as will panic. If we wanted it not to panic, I would do a try from and then I'd have a result that I'd have to do something with. Or I could do a wrapped, uh, or like, yeah. So there's basically three choices, right? You can let it panic, which is what as does, I, I think. You could have it wrap, or you could use something that detects an overflow and gives you a, a, an error. Only in release? So this will... Okay, so this will panic for a debug build, but for a release build, it'll wrap. Which I, is fine. This... it. We're only losing one bit out of 64 on a typical system, so... I'm I'm okay being sloppy. I don't need to do a result or a wrap or anything like that. If I really wanted to be like really pedantic about it, I would do something that gets a, a result. And if it's an error, I would actually put an error saying unable to insert element. You're 
bag is friggin huge and we can't store it <laughs> find a smaller bag the question about how to do boxes and boxes that's really easy we had that here right this um inside box is, is 4500 it's actually an element inside the outside box this is a, I, this is a deliberate test to have a box inside a box the problem would happen if the outside box were to be placed into the inside box Technically, we could store that in the database, but if I wasn't careful in the game engine, we might have an infinite loop or a stack overflow trying to find everything inside the box because we would just jump between the two boxes forever. Same thing would be a problem. The same problem would happen if we put the box inside of itself. Like if I did that, technically we could store that, but my game system would probably freak out trying to iterate the box recursively we would uh, never find the bottom of the box because the box is inside of itself sounds like i've added a code problem yeah yeah it could be one of the problems indeed did have to do with recursive boxes your bag is an infinite a squared it is finite i just made the number of slots very large and if I did make a game system that expanded your bag automatically, I'd probably put in some kind of soft cap to it where you would have to do something like expend credits to expand the bag, and I'd just make it increasingly more expensive to the point that you would need to put in more credits than you could obtain for the entire lifetime of the universe before it would go over 63 bits. Problem solved. Use the... Limit as size approaches the length of the of or the the uh, age of the universe or the number of atoms in the universe. Always works, right? <laughs> That's another way you can um, you can explain away something like this. You can say, well, sixty three bits is more items than you could actually have in the game universe ever. So this will never have a, never be a problem. I right, I've been talking entirely too long about this time to check it in and go move on to the next thing right i hope you guys enjoy the little diversions that we do which become big diversions i i find it very fun and challenging at the same time oh uh before i check in i should i should keep that separate right the entity stuff I should go through and um the other three subcomponents here and turn all these U32s that are actually entities, turn them into entity. Mobility is not an entity. So that is imported from super. Okay. What are entities here? Just this one. I could probably make other type aliases for these. Like this could be attribute level or something but i'm not going to descend to that level yet entity is used quite frequently so that's worth making a type alias for now because i could go to 64 bits with that one or i size right i don't think i'll ever have more than 2 billion or 4 billion uh, entities anyway so i'm not too worried about it I'll never have more than 2 billion if i do that's a good problem to have I like to say. Next entity ID is also an entity. So, just to be sure, I can go through um, this. Is there a shortcut to do find in? Oh, there is. Perfect. Find all U32s. Sender, chat, player. These are, oh, there's one. We found one. This is why you should always do this. Just go through and find all the U32s and ask the question, are any of these entities? That is not. But that is a candidate for its own type alias, right? Player ID. Another reason besides being able to change the type to use a type alias is that if you wanted to restrict arguments to have checks to make sure that you don't accidentally pass a character entity where a player ID is needed. If this was player ID and these were new types, you couldn't use them interchangeably. If they're type aliases, you can, I think, but if I wanted to have that extra type system check to make sure you don't confuse 
these two for each other, like a new type would solve that. Uh, points, conserve righty tickets, no. What about these? Double check all of these chat tabs. Oh, chat ignores. Those are in it. No, those are, those are player IDs. So there we go. I might want to have a player ID because it would go there too. Yeah, I think I might want to do player ID. This was just me being lazy. This should really be a U size because it's probably cast somewhere else. Export. Oh, no, it's not. It's read directly from the database. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, to be strict, we'd make it a new type. New type, it's, well, new type, it looks like a, a tuple structure with one element in it. Yeah, like A squared just said. Tuple struct with one element. But the fact that it becomes a struct makes the type different, uh, fundamentally different. Whereas the type alias is really uh, just a, a name change only. It doesn't change the type at all. Yeah. I'm really not, cons I don't need to make it a new type. Actually, maybe, what if we just do make it a uh, new type? That'd be a good experiment and actually make the code a little bit stronger, right? And then maybe do the same thing with player I ID. One thing at a time. That's a ticket ID. So same, I might want a ticket ID there too. The more I think about it, the more I'm like, like these are related types, constitution, dexterity, intelligence, and strength, but they're different than hit points, for example. It's not the same kind of thing. So I might want, I might want to go all out and make everything different types. I don't think I saw any other entity stuff there though. So compiler error, or are you? Okay, so I have an that error is probably caused by something else. Yeah, by this. Yes, right? Yeah. Yep. I want that type to be firmly in defined in components, in the entity components. This is our link from the player database tables to the um entity component system. All right, um, one round of running it to make sure I didn't break it, and then I think I'll do the make it into a new type, and I'll probably do the same thing with player ID at least. Make sure my data didn't get corrupted. Capabilities look good. That looks fine. Yeah, it looks fine too. Temporary entities is fine, and that. I changed that pretty quickly too, right? Mm. Yep, it was just putting the type name there. All right. Can you impl 32 without an alias? It won't let you because it'll say it wasn't declared in your module. Right? You get this thing. Um, oh, okay, you get a special one for U32, but like if you say something like... Um, Impl um, vec, right? If you try to make your own vector methods, you'll have a problem where it says, um, let's go to the error. It said, it'll say you can't define um, an impl for a type outside of the crate where, you, where it's defined. So there's a technique you can do that with traits where you can um, define a trait called like Vec, um, do you have to put a T here? Vec extension or something like that? Maybe that doesn't go there. And then you can say a uh, function, um, uh, new, um, something new for Vec that takes a, uh, vector, right? You can do that and then, um, 
you can then call that function as if it was a method of vector. And um, they, a lot of things do that. It's just a technique to um, extend an existing type. You're, you're technically using a trait for which you have no object, but you can, you can because you're not using self, right? I think it's sort of a loophole. <laughs> of course that compiles. That's a, that's a type extension. You can implement vector your, oh, you can do that? I didn't know you could do that. So you, you're saying I could implement vector of uh, temporary entities if I wanted and make my own methods of that? Um, I guess not. Is this probably the same problem? Yeah, same problem. You can't do that. If only, you would think that we should be able to do that, but I guess technically what we're trying to do then is we're, we're adding methods where we, we sh we're to something that's sealed. You can consider that that type itself is sealed. There are probably implications that I'm not understanding about why that needed to be sealed at that level. Maybe you can do that. Yeah, you can. Basically, the trait skirts around it by um, you're 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 adding um, syntactic sugar that looks like you're calling a method on vec, but it's not really. It's calling a method of a trait that doesn't need an instance of something. And so it's like a, as a side effect of using that trait's method, you're 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 calling a function that can take the reference to a vector, but it's not actually a method of that vector type. It it gets kind of weird because. This impl really isn't um, saying that these are the only functions that you can use with this type. It's just it's basically saying if you use this name in the context of a value of this type, then call this function and self means something, right? It's it's kind of lax when you think about it, which is why you can do you can do crazy things like impl a for a vec a of references to that. Um, if I did, um, I can't do it on vec directly, but I can do that. You can say, um, oh, sorry. Syntax is that, right? You can, you can define methods that work on references to something. I thought I could do that. So you can't do that directly. Anyway, um, I don't know the exact syntax. Maybe I shouldn't talk about things I don't know. Hey there, Tim. How are you doing? Auto deref. And null pointer reference. Is, thought, I forgot to say hi to you as well. Hi. Sorry, that was 10 minutes ago. 10 minute delayed hi, null pointer reference. You didn't pull on the type and auto deref will let you do that for references. Yeah, but you know what I mean, though, right? It doesn't, it's not like, like a, a, someone new learning Rust might conclude that when you define a structure like that, that name always goes for the impul, right? That goes with it. Um, but that's not necessarily true. You can, you can, you can have an implementation for things that are like types derived from the original type. Hey there, Jack. Started to learn Rust today, and oh God, is it tough? Oh yeah. Very tough. I, it took me, uh, what, four days to just get through the book. And then it took me several months until I started getting comfortable with things. And I'm still having trouble with the syntax. Like I just now just tried to show how to implement, how to add functions for a reference type, and I didn't quite get it right. <laughs> oh, it's a distractible day, Tim. That's fine. For us, for you to be distracted, it's fine for me to be distracted. That's okay for me to be in the background. Just like, I hope it's okay that sometimes you're in the background when I'm working and I'm not paying complete attention. You can't really implement like that. Implement trait just ends up creating a fat pointer to the trait implementation. Uh, not necessarily. A fat pointer to the implementation is when you, you, when you um, give a trait something. If you, somewhere in some function, foo, you have like a, uh, a, a, a S is a, um, or better be to, to make it, um, uh, generic something. 
if you said like the T is a dying something. Why can't I do that? Oh, that goes there, right? Uh, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> Is it that, um, it's reference to dying something? I can't remember this stuff. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Um, it's like this. And that has to be a reference. Um, maybe it's, yeah, it's not generic. You see, I, I'm still getting used to this. Um, that's when you have a fat pointer. When you use the reference to dine, this means that you need to pass, you can only use this with something that has a, basically a V table, a fat pointer. Fat pointer means that not only do you have a pointer to this, to the actual thing that implements the trait, but you all, it's a little bit wider because you have also a pointer to a table of all the implementations of the trait for that something. So you can later call foo on like, like if, some more concrete would be like shape, right? And if later I made a uh, struct circle, which is a shape, um, Uh, what is it? I think I'm getting confused between C++ and Rust again. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You don't do it that way, you do it this way. Why am I slipping back into C++? Anyway, um... Now I can call foo with a circle. And it circle fits in where a shape is required. But the pointer becomes fat because we don't only need a pointer to the actual circle. We need a pointer to all the methods of circle that need to be implemented for shape. So if we had like function um, describe self string. Now um, this has to have an implementation. So if we say string from circle. If this did something like print. Um, well, this will require me formatting. Well, if I, well, if I just said shape.describe. So, um, what's wrong with this? Oh, semicolon. I know I'm going off on a big tangent, right? So if you call foo on a circle, it's fat because you not only need the actual instance of circle, but you also need a pointer to this describe function because um, this function doesn't know about circle. It knows that whatever you give it will have a descri describe function, but which describe function? That's called, that's uh, the concept of a V table, virtual table. So the type circle itself will have a, uh, usually it's a fixed size table made by the compiler to, uh, that points to all of the functions that are defined, that are declared in the trait, but we're actually defining in the implementation. So it'll be a, basically a table with one entry because we only have one function and that's one area of memory and then for every instance of circle because we could have like you know we could have x we could have a data here and we might even um we might even like if we said radius we might say uh format circle of radius radius so the data for this um radius comes from the instance of the circle, but the location of this describe function is in the V table for circle. So that's why there are two things, which means why um, this is really a pointer to two things, which is why they call it a fat pointer. It's a pointer to the actual structure, which has a radius in it, and a second pointer to all the functions of circle that are, um, that are implementing requirements in shape. In C++, they do this with a single pointer, through um, the concept of, uh, I think it's called, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a convention that 
when you're pointing to a circle in C++, if, it, if this was like a base class shape, a circle starts with first a pointer to the to the circle's v table and then has then the r content so radius the 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 address of the radius in the circle might be the address of the circle plus the size of the pointer to the v table and that is kind of hidden away from you whereas in rust it's handled um explicitly through this kind of a a um, fat pointer so when you get a pointer to the circle you really are just getting the pointer to the circle but when you when you need a, a dynamic reference to a shape it's the pointer to the circle plus the pointer to the V table um, side by side. So it's it's the same in the end. It's just done way differently in Rust versus C++. Now I'm going to catch up and chat to see how many times I said something wrong. <laughs> Subtypes are tr for trait trait. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just had the syntax confused. Can you replace this with generics? Probably. Doing so erases the type information. That's what gener generics are, erases the type information because of mono mono something monomorphization. Basically, that the compiler uh, replaces generics with the concrete implementation everywhere. Whereas with traits, you retain some of the dynamic information, which is why with generics you don't need a v table because the compiler knows exactly what type is used if it's a generic. Whereas with the trait, it doesn't know until runtime. What's the extension from the cool arrows? Yeah, the font was sphere code with ligatures. If you want to know about the, if you want to try ligatures on your own, just go to, if you're using VS Code, go to settings and use this um, font ligatures. Turn, try turning that on to true and see what happens. If you have a font with them, you'll, you'll see nifty arrows. Monomorphization, yes. The trade object has no knowledge of the concrete type. That's right. Just like a base class has no knowledge of the derived type derived classes in C++. Yes. Same thing. A base class has no no knowledge of how a derived class might be used or the contents of a derived class. So everything that goes through a V table or goes through um some kind of way to know the size of and the in the configuration of a of a derived class. The derived class has to provide that. The base class doesn't know directly. Same problem so handled differently between the two languages. Okay, that that was a really huge diversion, wasn't it? That's fine. It's a it's a diversion stream. What was the last thing I did? Oh right, I I confirmed everything didn't break, and I just checked stuff in. Right? No, I didn't. I think that was, was what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to check stuff in that we're using entity. Oh, no. I wanted to make it actually a new type before I check it in. I want the strength of the type being different. So let's do that. So this becomes actually struct entity u32. And then I think to make it pleasant to use, we should be able to convert from a u32 to an entity, right? Or not. Uh, I can always refer to the book. What's the book say about new type again? Book. Um, new, oh, wrong button. New type. That's with an alias, right? But we're going to actually use a new type. Wait, hold on. Do they not explain it until later? Oh, it's an earlier section. Okay. Yes. Okay, so if we want the new type to have every method of the inner type, implementing the deref trait would be a solution. If we don't want the wrapper type to have all the methods, so I think we want to implement the deref trait then, right? for entity and then we can use it in all the right contexts yeah we can import that and then we can implement missing ones type target equals u32 right so then we just do self.0 do I have to do a borrow there yeah should we do deref mute also I suppose so 
Sure, why not? You might ask yourself, why don't they repeat the type target in here? It's because deref mute is actually derived from deref, and so it inherits all of the um, associated types, which I think is rather nifty. And I have to say mute here. Does it make sense to do deref here? I was... That's why I read carefully here. The book says, if we wanted the new type to have every method that the inner type has, which I think is okay, right? And what I want to avoid is weakening the strengths that we get from making it a new type. I don't think we're weakening it by implementing deref. It, I, if I implement it from and into, I might be weakening it, right? I'm not going to do any kind of integer ops on it. Why does deref return a ref? It just does. Um, the deref trait is just turning one type into a different type by dereferencing the star in front, right? Rust still has, Rust still has to um, handle turning a pointer into the thing pointed to. Yeah, it, it does return a reference, but then Rust will... Um, Rust does the part, if the type is the correct type, it'll automatically do what you think of as a dereference, like following the pointer. It does that for you. The deref trait is just turning one type into another type. That's why this is what we're implementing on, and the target is what we're going dereferencing it into. So that if I have an entity and I put a star in front, it can be used in the context of a U32. Right? And if it's if entity is used in the context of a U32 and I don't put a star, it's like implied by implicit dereference. You probably just want to the new type for type safety. Yeah, if I, I just want to, don't want to accidentally use an entity where a player ID is, is required. It's, if I implement it from and into, I might get... Actually, it'd be, it'd be okay because I, as long as they don't go directly between each other. If, there's, if, if you can go from a U32 to an entity or a player ID, but not directly between the two, I think we're still okay, right? So maybe it's okay to do an impulse from... Um, for entity, that's a generic, right? I have to give it a explicit type here. Um, ID, entity ID. So now I don't have to um. I don't, I can use an entity directly in that, okay, maybe, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused. Do I need from to use an entity where a U32 is required? Maybe I don't need a from there. Maybe that's only doing from an exp, making it explicit. What's entity is for? It's for tracking everything in the game. So, for example, um, if we look at the database, um, this this box has this number, right? So to find out, it's sort of like the handle to to this box. Um, the 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 components basically are adding different categories of data for the entity. The container component says what items are inside and if it's open. But if we if we search for that number elsewhere, we'll find other information about it. Like here's um, who is looking at the box. Nobody. Here's where the box is in space. It's in at depth 20 at x1, y3, z6862, right? And this is what the box looks like. It says go to tile set 2363 and pick out tile 6 to show the box. So it's it's basically the common key, the handle you can think of. And it's just the way I've designed my entity component system. So it's separating the identity from the components of the thing the the identity the thing's identity is the number but to have any actual data you have to associate components with that entity if that makes any sense so think of it this way like the box has a component and a position and a tile um i misspoke the box has a container position and tile components right so it can't attack you but if i were to add the npc component to the box and set the npc attributes so that it's a monster the box could start to attack you in the game 
So it's it makes the system pretty flexible, separating the identity of the box from its data. Yeah, now it's a mimic, exactly. And when you kill the mimic, killing the mimic just deletes the NPC component off of the box. A box doesn't have to become a different thing. It can just morph into an inanimate box. Having this deref would allow you to do integer operations, which are not good for an ID. I suppose so, but I never do integer operations on the ID. So you're saying like, um, instead of doing deref, I should... So you're saying deref doesn't really buy me anything? I mean, you might be right. Let me see what what happens if I don't implement anything on the ID. I should get some compiler errors, right? Let me see what the nature of those compiler errors are. Okay, so I need to implement to SQL for it. I can do that, right? So maybe we don't need deref or from. But I do need impl rustqlite to SQL for entity. Basically, we need to say, well, how do you store it in the database? How we store it in the database is to um, just yield its internals, right? Um, and it's always, we can always do that. Is it wanting a reference? Uh, is that how we do it? Okay, I don't know what this 2SQL output type means. Oh. Just say it's um, owned, I guess. Owned self dot zero because you just copy it, right? Uh, no. Value. What's value? Okay, owned in. Okay, <laughs> this is getting a bit elaborate. What type is this? Just have your impl of 2SQL call the U32's impl. Oh. Okay, I'll do that in a second. Mostly just exploring what I would have to do to do it all manually. So it's telling me it wants even more veneer here, right? Value integer that, right? Almost. As I-64. <laughs> okay, so that's if I wanted to do manually, which I was about to do, but then learning from Sarian is saying that I don't need to do that. I can simply forward it, right? So it would be what? U32? Um, to SQL? Of self.0? I, I get that right? Uh, reference. Or, is that right? It wanted a reference, right? Yes. So now we're just leveraging its type, which is probably doing the same thing. Uh, and I can't click to it. Actually, is that a... Did I do that right? Because when I control click, is that just recursively calling myself? Hmm. It's fine. So the compiler's just getting confused. I get worried when I control click and it doesn't go where I want. Okay, there's something else going on here. Okay, so I don't, I didn't, I don't, um, I can't serialize it. That's, a, that's another problem. I have to implement serialize. Uh, I can just derive it, right? Okay, that solved a bunch of them. What's the error here? Okay, there's no from string implemented for it. Right, I have this generic that will pull from the database if it, if it can be parsed from a string, so it can't. So we'll do, we have to do the same thing. We have to implement... Um, from string for entity. But I can do the same thing by forwarding it, right? Hmm. 
U32. And do that, right? And then I can say um, U32 from string self.0. Oh, there's no self. Uh, it's just S. And I have to return, so I need to um, map, right? Mm, entity to entity, entity. Actually, I guess I can just say entity, right? Thank you for the follow. Okay, now we got all those compiler errors done. <laughs> CRD transparent, what does that do? Will serialize? Do I really care about serializing? I think I do care. How would it? Actually, I'm kind of curious how it serializes now. Yeah, I'm gonna go through the. I'm gonna give you another. Give you a points uh, a squared, but I want to actually see it serialize differently. Okay. Oh yeah, it. It's it doesn't implement equal. Okay, but we can just forward all that stuff, right? It needs equal it needs partial equal and it needs hash what else does it need it needs what from sql all right the rescuelite from sql can't spell for entity Is this generic? Don't tell me it's generic. I can't control click it. Uh, consider importing this trait. <laughs> okay. I'm trying, I'm trying to import it. Why not? Let's look it up. I think it's because it um, is a more complex type. Oh, what am I th thinking? What am I doing? Oh, what am I doing? It's not there. It's um, types. Why didn't that need to types in front? So they export to SQL, but not from SQL? Interesting. All right. Whatever. Yeah, they um, re-exported to, but not from. Makes me wonder if I'm doing this wrong. Uh, but I really just want to forward it, right? U32 from SQL. A column result. Self dot zero. It needs a value ref though. Components entity value. What's a value ref? Actually, I guess I'm just calling value, right? No, that's not that's not right. Oh, no, I just do entity value. But there's some other problem here. Oh, no, it's it's this way. <laughs> it's one way or another, right? But then I have to package it as a result. So it would be a map. Like that. Yes. Okay, <laughs> like the other one. Yeah, I should just have done that. I don't know what I'm thinking. You can see how my mind operate kind of operates weird sometimes. I'm leaping to things. Okay, but uh, I think we're getting there, right? There's only a few compiler errors left. What's this? It's private. Indeed, it's private. Let's make it public. More errors. 
Oh, I don't implement copy. Let's do that. Uh, go to it. Yes. Uh, we have to implement it ourselves. Um, no, no code actions. Okay. Because copy is what? Oh, it's a marker trait? Wait, then how do I make it copy? Oh, it's... Wait a minute. Derive copy clone, but it can't be derived. Oh, is it because it, it couldn't be derived because I don't implement clone? Yeah, okay. You can tell I hardly ever do these things. This is why this is a great exercise. I'm learning, right? I'll, I'll now learn that it's probably not going to serialize properly, and then I'll learn the CRD attribute that A squared told me about. Okay, so it's going to work, but it's probably going to look funny in the uh, S, in the um, SQL in the in the in the export, right? Let's see what it looks like. No, it worked. It's serialized correctly. There you go. Well, I'm glad you are Metro Dev. This is like my favorite way of streaming is um, taking these side excursions, especially if they're encouraged by chat, because I'm learning something. And if I, I know if I'm learning something, there's got to be some viewers who are also learning something too. It might be a little bit frustrating because you might already know it and you don't need to learn it. Or maybe like, I should know this. But I think most people enjoy either just the sound of my voice or they enjoy that um, there's maybe a few things that you don't really think about, but now I'm looking at it, so now maybe you learn something about it. Maybe 30 special cases, new types? It might. Well, 30 does, but I think 30 JSON is what's helping us out here, right? 30 JSON probably says for a new type just to serialize the thing inside the new type. Right? It probably is just transparent for 30 JSON. And I'm only using that type with Serdy JSON, so then I don't need to do anything special. So now, now A squared, you, you and I have both learned something today. <laughs> I don't need any attribute in Serdy, and I learned that I can uh, forward to this type here, and that I need to implement all of these things from string. I kind of sh I should have known that I needed that because I do it for parsing. And I think that was it. It's actually not that much in the end, right? It's just we need to derive all of these traits and we need to implement these three traits on our own, but they're really not much more than forwarding to our underlying type. In fact, you could argue that you could make a derive for these traits for a new type and this is how you would implement it you would um you if you only only needed it for a new type then it was it would always be self.0 and it would always be the inner type here and here and here right so i could almost make a macro myself to do that i'm not going to go that far <laughs> Didn't need DREF, DREF. Okay, so I learned that I, did, I learned that I didn't need the DREF because I'm so that I I can't actually do integer operations, which actually makes this stronger now. Now if I accidentally add something to an entity ID, I should get an error, right? Like if I um, let's say I tried to do that uh, for a character. Let's say in export I tried to add one to the entity. It's not going to let me do that, right? It's going to say you can't add to, um, yeah, can't add I32 to, why does it say unit? Entity is not a unit. It's an unknown. That's strange. It's a, it thinks it's a unit, probably because it doesn't know the exact type. If I told it that entity is an entity, though, it would probably give me a 
can I? No, I can't do it that way. Shoot. Um. Yeah, it's not gonna. Well, the the fact that it's an error is good enough, right? I wouldn't have gotten an error before if I used the U32 here. Yeah, you're right. It can't infer the type, and so it just kind of gets confused and says, "Oh, well, uh, unit then." <laughs> But yeah, that is good enough that it catches me on that. So I shouldn't be able to do any math on entity IDs. All right, so I kind of want to do the same thing for player IDs. So that's what I'm going to do. I need to take a break soon, though, because I'm getting a headache. I had a migraine yesterday, and I don't want it to come back. The migraine, like, shut me down for a good couple hours. Yeah, let's copy all this stuff. I essentially want that for players as well. So let's move that here and call it um, player ID. Sure. Okay, now wherever uh, we have U32, for player IDs, I can substitute right here, right? Player ID. Import from players. Correct. Okay, here's a player ID. We ignore other players. That's step that's the root player ID there. There's where I would use ticket ID, actually. Here I need, uh, oh, wait. These IDs are all player IDs. Those are not player IDs. These are both player IDs. I like this. Strengthening of the type system. So, like, if I extend this for ticket IDs, I use ticket ID there, because that's not a ticket ID, but that one is. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to implement the display trait for player ID to get some of these errors fixed, right? So there. So that'll need to be imported. Ticket ID. All right, so errors. Players first, right? I think this is all in the format. Yes, yeah, so I need to impl implement the display trait. So that's easy, right? Can't I just... Um... Actually, what what would it do if I implemented the display trait here? It, it actually won't work, right? Yeah, I have to do it myself. Implement display for player ID. Display comes from format, so implement that, and we would just say um, u32, no, self.0.format f. Okay. What's this one? Ooh. That was wrong all the time? Player and slot. Why is this? Oh, right. They have to be the same type unless I use the params. Yeah. That params macro is when you have mixed types, because that ID is a player ID, but the slot is just a U32. So that that hides them with trait, uh, trait objects. Trait objects. And one more down here. Okay, so I don't have a convert from I size. What would I implement? Try from, I think. Try from my size. Okay. Let's do that. Hold on. I'll catch up with chat in a minute. 
try from you I size for player ID. Type error equals um, I size as try from I size error. Same error type. And then um, value dot zero dot try f uh, no I size try from value dot zero. Right? Mm, yes. No. <laughs> it's the other way around, isn't it? I have to do a map or something. Wait. Right, I have to do a map player ID. This. No, wait, 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 wait. Oh, it's U32. What am I doing? Hey there, uh, X Z Ducky Z X. And Rosmic, you are old. Are you a fan of good thunder pumping? I don't know what you're talking about. But I'll still give you a wave. Hello, I'm looking to learn Rust. How are you finding it? I'm finding it very enjoyable to learn Rust. Please. No problem, Roth. The argument type is wrong. I got the argument type wrong. I'm my, I'm having a trouble. I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around this. Okay, the the error type is wrong. Yes. Right? Yes. When all the red squiggly lines go away, then you're in business. <laughs> Not too sure what this is. Oh, what this is, I'm making a game. It's going to take many years to make it because I'm doing it from scratch. Here's what it looks like. It's for old people like me who remember that games look like this in the 1980s. Yeah, you know, ancient games. Sometimes we call them retro to feel better about ourselves. But basically, I'm trying to write a game from the 1980s from scratch by myself. And you play it in the web browser. And I got this far, and then I realized I want to change to a different programming language. So that's what I've been doing lately. You see one of the games? The, the link is there. Try it out. There's not much you can play on it, though, because it's still a work in progress. There's very little you can do. You can talk to this dude. He doesn't say much. You can fight these slimes if you figure out how to equip your weapon and use it. The air type, there's, and it's super neat. Infallible. Interesting. Basically, it's saying it can never fail. Cool. Yeah, so that's, at a very high level, what my stream is about. Making my own game from scratch based off of games that I played when I was about your age, actually. And maybe, you know, for 30, 40 years from now, you'll be doing a similar thing, but you'll probably be making Call of Duty instead of Ultima 4. <laughs> so um, you can think of this code as looking at that game with a microscope. We're looking at a very, very small percentage of the game in the programming language that I'm picking. And if you want to learn more about that programming language, I would suggest you go on to your favorite search engine and type Rust Learn. This is the um, Rust, not the game Rust, but the programming language called Rust. Yeah, old games from the 1980s were kind of like Dwarf Fortress. Not a whole lot of graphics, just a primitive amount of graphics, and a lot of it was just text-based. So yeah, I, I'm making a game like that both because it's a nostalgia, uh, nostalgia. It reminds me of games I used to like, and also games that are old are easier to make now because 
the requirements were easier back then, right? What you could do um, on a game engine was a lot less than you can do now. So it's a lot easier for someone who's just getting into game development or someone like be making a game from scratch to actually make the game and not take forever to do it, is to make something that's old, to remake it. If you tried to make World of Warcraft, it, you would never do it as a single person unless you were like super genius, which I'm not. Thank you for the follows, by the way. Okay, so that that was to make the player ID a specific type, call a new type. Do I want to just go all in and just make the ticket ID also? Why not? Why not make the ticket ID also like a player ID? I'll just copy all this junk. Why not? Ticket IDs can be special just like player IDs. So basically search or place all these places where we say player ID, make it ticket ID, import the types we're missing, and we're done, right? Import from format, import from try from. Smells like macro time? Yeah. Does kind of Sarian, doesn't it? Hey there, Tan. I don't have a time command. I'm actually not sure what a time command would do. You mean like uptime? Uptime is three hours. Six minutes and 12 seconds. And I mistyped the zero, but you know what I meant. I can just keep typing. There's the uptime. <laughs> there should be one below the stream. I used to have one on stream before Twitch actually showed it. But yeah, we've been going a little bit more than three hours. If you meant like follow time that or follow age, I don't know. Stream elements might know. Um, ticket ID. So back to searching. Everywhere we use U32, it might be a ticket ID, right? Not there, not... Oh, this is a player ID. Caught one that I missed before. Look at that. We need a player ID there. Chat ID, there's another thing that might be a distinct type. These are not... Client ID might be special too. Ah, maybe not. I don't think I use it too often. Okay, here, definitely. That's definitely a ticket ID. Uh, import that, please. That's also a ticket ID. All right. Oh, another player ID I missed. Ticket ID, there's the primary one, right? Oh, that's the primary one. This is to generate the next ticket. All right. Okay, so that's definitely a ticket ID. I might have hit them all by now. It looks like it. Any errors? No errors? Run it and see if, if it works. Hey there, Jerry. Very understandable for someone who learns English. Also, you stream programming language. Great. I think I speak too quickly and I slur my words sometimes. But I try. All right. I'm going to compare the output to the input. Full circle debugging. So that would have affected character and players and tickets, right? All right, the end, all right, this had entities in it. Um, players had uh, player ID. And then the... Okay, I don't have any examples of people being ignored, do I? Chat ignore or ignore. No, they're all empty. All right, anyway, uh, the tickets, though. I had those in the tickets file. Yeah, I think it's working. They're all just numbers when it goes out to JSON, so we're good, I think. I'm going to check it in now. Check it in, then move on to the next thing. Hey there, Initiative. Hey there, Dante. Can you show that trick of writing on multiple lines at the same time? Sure. So this only applies, as far as I know, to VS Code, so your editor might be different. Uh, there's several ways to do it. You can either um, pick a word and hit Control D, and it selects the you know the next one. I can type whatever, and I have multiple cursors there. You can click and then Alt click in other places, 
to add more cursors. Um, the other thing you can do is you can pick something, you can hit con Control shift l and it picks everywhere in that file that has the same word. Um, other tricks you can do are like if you want to do a whole row here, just pick one and then Control out Control alt down arrow just adds cursors down. Or you can start at the bottom, Control alt up arrow. Um, I also have this custom one where I just select a block of code and hit Alt L, and it puts a cursor on the ends of all the of, on the ends of everything. There's multiple ways to do it, and your editor will be different probably. I uh, I know that Vim and NeoVim are really popular on Twitch, and I know a bunch of streamers who I could refer you to if you're using NeoVim or NVim or Vim, and you want to know how to do that. But I can't tell you myself because I don't know. No immediate allergic reaction. Well, that's good. Riley Monkey, congrats. All right, I, I was gonna check stuff in. So yeah, I hope that answered the question. There's there's uh, many ways to do it in VS Code. I went through a bunch of them. I, hopefully I got them all, and then your editor might be a lot different. Just a quick shout out, I think, to the Primogen. You should check out his stream, especially if, if Let's say you wanted to know the same trick, multi-line edit, but in NeoVim or Vim, he's the guy that I would ask. Say, hey, Primogen, how do you do multiple cursors in NeoVim? And he'd probably um, give me a great answer. All right. Yeah. I did multiple things in this commit, which is a bad thing, but that's okay. We'll just have a multi-change commit. So this is add containers to what to game state and then use new types for player ticket and entity ids that was a lot of this change right there's the container stuff i'm basically going through all the ch files i changed to make sure that what's written here in the description is what I actually did and I, and, uh, I catch everything that I did. And I'm also kind of reviewing to look for things that look strange that might not belong in the commit. Yeah, see these are all just replacing blank uh, or bland U32s with specific types. Okay, there's something that I missed. So I like to have all the uses in one block for sorting and I didn't, and it didn't m catch it on mail. So let me fix that. So, so that and then hit F5. So now it looks better, all right. Looks good, moving on. The player ID stuff. I think I did a lot more chatting than I did programming in the last hour. <laughs> okay. Because I'm looking at the differences and there are not really that much, there's not really much in the difference department, is there? Uh, revert this one. This again is a side side effect of the export command. I don't want to check in. All right, so yeah, I only did two things <laughs> for all that hour. So this is what work in progress on import export of game state. All right, commit that. Move on. Got an email today for vaccination appointment for a different person. Okay, I hope that person is someone you know. Otherwise, Monka S, what happened to their database, right? I don't know. Next in the component list, how much longer do I want to go? It's been three hours, it's five o'clock. Mm, maybe I just need to hydrate. I don't want to push it. What happens when I stream too long and I get overwhelmed is I I won't stream the next day because I get burned out <laughs> I gotta pace myself okay next in the original snapshot we have done the first three caps character container and dialogue is next dialogue is really deep though we can do it we can do it yeah thank you for the follows dialogue Somewhere, yeah, here I had the schema I wanted to carry over. It's a bunch of tables. Dialog, dialog, state, dialog, choice, dialog, event. Right. So we're moving that over to the new migrations list. 
it looks pretty much the same only these are using a different syntax to show the string so all these semi all these double quotes go away here I'm hitting just control D over and over again and hit delete uh, that indentation got destroyed multi cursor by alt clicking semicolon and again, multi-cursor with alt, click, entity. Do I want to change anything else? Actually, they look pretty good to me. Says the guy who did six streams on the... Yeah, I did five streams, and then the next week I only did two because I was burned out. <laughs> Any recommendation for solid SQLite crate? I just use Rusculite. That's what I'm using. Rusculite. It looked like it was the popular one when I looked for it on... Uh, I, I used LibRS instead of crates.io, but yeah. It's got 91,000 downloads. It's pretty stable. It's been updated not, not in too distant past. It's got a pretty nice API. Yeah, no problem, Jace. If you guys have a better one, you can always let me know. Uh, what I would recommend doing is you just search, do a keyword search for like what is it SQLite? Yeah, that's what I was just on. What was I doing? And you just look for, look look down the list. Looks like if you just want to bind directly to the library, that one's pretty popular too. This I th I think RustQLite is just a a, a wrapper around lib SQLite three. You can see it's in their dependencies list. So if you want to go s s closer to the metal, so to speak, you could go to libsqlite3-sys. Looks like there's some alternatives there that aren't that that are kind of popular too. There we go. I wonder why that has hashtag #sqlite in it. There's the one that um, a few of you were mentioning earlier. SQLX. So it supports SQLite. So got some different idea different ideas there. Pretty new to crates. Yeah, you know what was the really, the, the, my favorite Rust moment of last week was I wanted a progress bar for a command line tool. And so I went into here and I just typed console progress bar. And it was this first one that popped up, right? And I'm like, okay, I'll check it out. And I ran it and man, it was really impressive. Like they don't have, they don't have anything here to do it justice. Maybe on their documentation page. But yeah, it all this stuff is just done for you automatically. You just make the progress bar and you update it by just calling a, sing, a function to increment progress. And it does all the console printing and the animation for you automatically. It even like estimates the uh, completion time and the number of increments per second like automatically totally impressive <laughs> and that's my that's been my experience a lot in rust is that like i'm like wondering hey is there i wonder if someone's written someone has written a library to do this really niche specific thing that i but i'm looking for so i'll just put into the search bar and yeah i'll find not just one but several crates that do that and and they're really really high quality and used by a lot of people a lot of downloads and they just work very, very happy so far with the ecosystem of rust libraries yeah, it works for Windows. Isn't that impressive, Metro Dev? That's you might have noticed it in my uh, when I was running it here, right? When I was importing, I did that because initially it was extremely slow, and I didn't know how long it would take. And it was slow because I didn't put all of my import into one single transaction. And then I learned by searching online that SQLite is really slow if you do a lot of statements in separate transactions. But if you put them all in, a, in one monster transaction, it's really fast. In fact, uh, can I demonstrate that before we move on? I can, right? Why not? Then you can actually see that progress bar in action. Go to this main and then on the, on the top level import, I will just comment out where it says begin transaction and end transaction. And then I will let you witness how dang slow it becomes. It's like orders of magnitude slower. Look at that. You see how slow that was? 13 per second? Okay, my face is covering it. it you know, uh, here, I'll hit enter a few times. 
1.6 players per second, 13.13 players per second, right? So I just put it into one monster transaction, run it again. But yeah, it was so slow that I'm like, I wanted to see a progress bar because I, I didn't know if I could make it any faster. But yeah, just putting into a single transaction, now it's in the hundreds and... Oh, I went too far. <laughs> hundreds or thousands of, of them per second. My face is in the way again. There, move out of the way. 488 and 3,400 per second. <laughs> so I probably don't even need the progress bars anymore because it's so fast that it's... Anyway, big diversion. But yeah, it was super easy to use. And this has been my experience for a lot of things in Rust. You just... Um, I don't even see where I make it. Where did I make it? Oh. Is it here? Yeah, progress bar. You just make a new one. You tell it how, how many steps you're going to take, and you just increment it, and then you finish with, uh, you know, end of line. That's all I needed to do. Super easy. Okay, we're doing dialogues now. So, probably I want a new module called dialogues. Dialogue, dialogues, dialogue. Depends on what the name is here. It's dialogue singular. Okay. I guess we'll just copy from, I don't know, capabilities for now. Just to start out, turn capabilities. Here's where I'm going to do control shift L and then type dialogue. All right. So then see how it renamed it everywhere. That's pretty cool. I think. Okay, the structure for a dialogue, it's the same, right? A component and an entity, so that's the same. So then a dialogue component has a name and then a map of states. Okay, so name, string. Oh, there's also an M. Okay, this is where it's coming back to bite me that I abbreviated it and I don't remember what it means. What is What would M mean? Modal. That's what it was. Modal. I remember death is a modal dialogue, right? Modal. Option. Bool. And it's... I don't want it to print out if it's null, so... Um, how did I do that before? I always forget these things, so I have to copy from where I used them earlier. The character that had it? Yeah, skip serializing this thing. Skip serializing if none. Okay, and then after the name is the, uh, these are the states. That's what S stood, stood for. S, pub states is a hash map from string to dialogue state. That's a dialogue state, you ask. I'm glad you asked. A dialogue state is, I think these are choices, and V was, what was V again? I don't remember. I'll probably have to search for that in the old code base. Unless someone remembers what the V stood for. I guess I can look at the tool. Look at the in-game tool for dialogues. Dialogues. Build a tiger. What would V be here for a state? These are choices. What would V be? There's modal, by the way. What? I don't even remember. What is V? Visible? Oh, yeah. But where would I set it here? Oh, it's this type, isn't it? And there were three types. Normal, multi-choice, and branch. Wait. But that's a Boolean.
Okay, <laughs> I gotta search for it. I'm gonna look for the word multi-choice in all the JavaScript files. Oh, whoa. What the heck? Oh, why did I do it that way? That's so hokey. So it's a three state. It's an optional Boolean. It's either false, true, or not present. <laughs> that was so dumb. How come no one on stream told me that it was dumb when I did it that way? Wow. Okay. Well, okay then. That's dumb. I think I'm going to try to fix it here by making it um, be uh, an enum. And I'll have to implement the from and to SQL for that, but that's fine. I'll probably just turn them into strings in the SQ SQLite. I don't remember why it was V. I think, it, I think you were right. Uh, null pointer reference. I think it used to be yeah, it used to be that um, there are only two cho only two possibilities. It's a normal state or it's a multi-choice state. And a multi-choice means you get to see the choices and you get to pick like multiple choice. So V stood for visible. If the choices are visible, then it's a multi-choice state where you list all the choices to the player. Yeah, so the, the names are horrible. So we need to fix it here, right? So it really is like... what it's it, it, this this variable represents how choices are shown and branch the branch mode was even more strange right i can't even remember what this was used for branch in the c++ code maybe Wow. Oh, there it was. That's a branch. Okay, here's a state branch. Um, but what does that mean? I can't remember. It'll probably come back to me at some point, but yeah, this is bad. <laughs> I think it had to do with dialogues that had to wait for a script to run. All right, uh, let me try to make sense out of this for now. I mean, if I'm, I'll just make a guess, and if I'm wrong, I'll come back here and change it. So it's um, C for choices. So that's pub choices. And that's also a map, it looks like. Yeah. Hash map from string to dialogue choice. And then v the notorious V. Which I'm going to say is um, visible. I'm going to put a note here. Note. Originally, dialogue choices were either visible, as in the client uh, would um, get to see all possible choices and pick one, or not. Um, let me. Re this is worded badly. Dialogue choices were either visible or not. A visible in this case, visible meant the client would get to see all possible choices and pick one. Uh, a third state branch or third variant 
branch was added. Sorry, someone's yelling in the house. I can't talk at the same time or you'll hear them too. A third branch was added, which has different semantics. Fix me. Need to figure this out and document here. Option bull. I think we'll just keep it there for now and have a fix me. Figure it out and document it. Because then that'll affect the, the name here and then the um Oh I didn't I wanted to actually use an enum here for now, right? Dialogue state. Well dialogue cho Dog uh, semantics? Semantics is a horrible word, but I can't think of a better word. Semantics is uh, the meaning of a word, phrase, sentence, or text. No, I'm not going to use that word. It's really, it has to do with the choices, right? Choices mode, I guess. Ah, oh, that's a horrible name, but we'll go with it. You have to pick something, right? But there are three possibilities, right? Normal, multi-choice, and branch. And I should also just have a to-do here. Figure out what this was for and revisit this name. I like display mode, but it had... I'm pretty sure this branch variant had other connotations, like it was used when the server had to know that it might not be completed right away. You have to wait for a script to, to execute. Dialogue mode sounds good. It's for a specific state of a dialogue, though. Um, maybe it's dialogue state mode. I hate these words. <laughs> And and it, it is tied to the choices for those two. Um, yeah, this is really bad. To do, these names are bad and need to be improved. If I do that, it'll serialize, right? Okay. I'll th I'll need to annotate those for surety, right? Oh, wait a minute. Um, I think I actually need to serialize this differently. Here, yeah. I need to actually, um, I, I had did this before. Um, serialize with, serialize with. Yeah, I need to do this thing. Need to make a function that will um, serialize uh, dialogue choices mode. Because I need to turn it from a, boo a boolean, an optional boolean, into into this enum. Voice true, voice false. Do we figure out what V was uh, the closest? I think is it used to be visible. As in, they're originally visible or not, but I mutated the thing with a third state, which I don't rem exactly remember. So this is a fragility point in the design I need to fix. But it's a different set of... It's a different work item, right? It's a different thing I need to do. Oh, did you see? Did you guys see that? The, the chat overlay momentarily hiccuped. <laughs> anyway, um... I have those out of order, don't I? Uh, 
MNS. Oh, okay. I'm getting confused between um, dialogue and state. C and V, and there's no more, right? Just C and V. As far as I know. I have the I have to do's here to come back and revisit and fix this. <laughs> we'll fix it later. Not right now. One thing at a time. So I need dialogue choice. This one. This isn't compiling because I forgot to do the mod at the top here, right? Dialogue. Now it's going to have all much compiler errors, which is fine. Okay. A hash map, we know about that. Comma need, needed there. These functions don't exist, and this dialog choice needs to be added. Okay, dialog choice. Has an event list. R was what? Requirement. R was a script requirement. S was the um, next state. Yeah, that's what it was. I'm glad I'm finally documenting what these fields mean. EPUB um, events vec of dialog event. R was um, requirement, requirements string. And S is a next state string. Oh, we're talking about if I were to put doc comments in here? Yeah. If you do triple triple that, then um, the, whatever I type here becomes a doc comment for that. This is not a doc comment, though. A dialogue event. All right, what's in an event? There's a message, a tell, and maybe a script, right? I think that's what it was. So, a bunch of renames. Message. If there is a script, it's second. Okay, so this is optional. Pub, script, option, string. This is message, string, and this is a tell. As in what to tell, what to tell the client, I think. Oh, no, no, that's message. This is type. The type of the um, event. Actually, I'm, I'm reconsidering this enum. This is enum is just because I don't want to use optional option bool because the it's gross. Yeah, okay, that's good enough. There's a bit of chaos in my house as people have realized that they need to go somewhere. I might take a break for a minute to sync up with everyone else in the house to figure out what's going on. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. All right, sync up complete. Apparently there was an activity that was they thought was virtual, but turns out it's not virtual. They're actually going back to some in-person things for extracurricular stuff. Okay, I need uh, two functions. Okay, so where'd I copy that from here? Yeah. Where are those functions? Here they are. Okay, serializer. That's the easier one, so I suppose I'll just put it here. Dialogue choices mode.
So we're going to serialize it as an option, right? Uh, it doesn't know what serializer is. Import it from CRD. Yes. So serialize. Oh, either none or some. Okay, so match dialogue choices mode. Normal was... Okay, I had that in the JavaScript at some point, right? Yeah, I had... It looked for multi-choice in JavaScript, and I had a nice map in there. Right, so normal is false. So that's... Serializer, serialize, bool, false. Multi-choice was true. Oh, I need to put it instead of a sum. Uh, serialize sum. How is that used? Sum value. Uh, okay. So I just put uh, false here. And then this is serialize none. I think, I think that's what I want. Serialize is easy. The deserialize is harder. I don't think it's too much harder though. Ah, uh, shoot. I miss. I lost where we copied this from. Oh, here we go. No, that's not it. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, I might need a visitor. I'm not sure though. Let's see. Okay, this deserializes to that. All right. My uh, thought about different editors is just use what you like. I think a lot of the editors out there are achieving parity with each other for the common features. Some editors are much better at some features than others. And so it depends on whether you use the features that are tuned the way that you like. If the editor fits you and what you're doing with it. Okay, so what am I going to deserialize here? Option. I am, yeah, I need to make a visitor. So this is what I was afraid of. It shouldn't be too hard though, right? I'm just going to end up making a, an empty struct. So this is going to be uh, like dialogue choices mode as option visitor. As option bool visitor. <laughs> a really long name. Right? And that's the type that I make uh, down here. And then I got to uh, let's qualify it as CRDD. Because visitor is too generic. Implement and missing members, yes. Okay, the value is dialog choices mode, right? That's the output mode. Okay, and then I need to do an expecting where I expect the type. So I should be doing like expect a, an option. So an optional boolean. All right, then I got to do implement default methods. And we're going to do, we're not going to visit these other types, right? Maybe bool because the bool is inside the option. So I might need another visitor. For that, I want to visit, right, visit none and visit some. Right. To delete all these other methods. Okay. Okay, so visit none. How do I write this? So it's just okay. Oh, this, yeah, this one's 
that uh, straightforward, right? If it's none, then it's branch. If it's some, then I need to visit the actual... Um, how does that work? Do I delegate it to that deserializer? <laughs> Here's where I'm not quite sure how to do it. What's that? Uh, yeah, I don't think I do visit bool. I think that's just badly inserted code from the helper. Um, I think I'm supposed to do a, another visitor that expects a boolean here. So can I do like... Deserializer dot deserialize bool, I guess. Oh, I need a visitor. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess that's with another visitor, but just has bool. Yeah. This is where it gets pretty gross. All right, and then implement missing ones, expecting a Boolean. A Boolean. Implement default, so I just need visit bool. I can do this. <laughs> it's not too bad. Stick with it. All right, so we're given the bool, so it's going to be if v then it is oh shoot i lost it if it's true then it's multi choice multi choice else i wonder if it's going to suggest that i put the okay on the outside otherwise it's normal i don't know I've heard people have different preferences. Some people like it the way I did it, wrote it at the beginning. Others like it this way. This makes more sense to me that we we're saying on the outside, we know it's going to be okay. What's in the okay variant of result is depends on what V is. All right. So then, uh, what's the compiler error? All right, type value is the same. Dialog choices mode. All right. Okay, and I haven't written this code yet. You have to have a local and then okay local? Or you like to have a local and then okay local? That might look better. So let mode equal this and then okay mode yeah i think i like the look, look of that too yep you like the match syntax or yeah i could use the match syntax but i think if i use the match syntax it's going to tell me that really i could just simplify it down to an if right i could say a match true that false i think it's going to warn me though Oh, no. I think that's even more visually appealing. But yeah, actually, I'm not running Clippy on this yet because we have compiler errors. It might come back. Clippy might come back and tell me that to make that an if else. I don't remember. I'll keep it like that. I like, I like the look of it. Okay. Am I down to the leaf nodes yet? <laughs> I think I am. Unless I miss something. I might have missed something, though. I have a feeling I missed some optional thing. We'll find out when we um, export it and we find it's missing when I do a diff, I think. Oh, here we go. There's an N possible for a uh, choice. I think that's name. 
And it's after E before R. Okay, yeah. I had a feeling I was missing something. Pub name option string. And uh, again, for an optional one, I would like to tell it to um, not emit it if it's n if it's none. I keep losing that. Yeah, there it is. Mm, there and there, right? Yep. Oh, I should also do the same thing for um the mode, right? Where is that? Where did I end up using dialect choices mode? Oh, down here. Yeah, so here. Uh yeah, grab this. Oh, I already had that. Oh yeah, so then I just need this. Right? Actually, I don't know if that'll work with that type. I might need to make a function to say skip serializing if it is branch. So let's be more specific. Is branch. And we'll make a function called is branch. Yeah. Ample dialog choices mode. Function is branch, takes a self reference, gives me a bool back out. If let self branch equal self, well, true. Eh. Eh. Else false. Or does it look better as a match? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So components doesn't have dialogue. We're going to add that now. Pub dialogue. Vec of dialogue. Import it. And dialog self export dialog db. All right, I'm obligated to provide this functions now. Match would look better. Okay. Then that would be match. Well, match borrow. Well, we don't have to borrow twice, right? Just do match self. True. Otherwise, false. It's just, I hesitated to do that because I don't like doing the catch-all. But I think this being a special case of it, we only care about one branch. So it's fine. Okay, so how do we handle a dialogue? Insert dialogue. I think I did all the tough work. Now, this, all this rest of this stuff should flow naturally, right? So it's just an entity and a name name and then um, for state in self component uh, for uh, dialog dots should have filled in something there oh component dot states into dialog states state values three values entity state and choices visible oh there we go it, it was visible but it was choices visible i don't want to do that though i'm going to make a change to how i was doing the um schema since i have this opportunity let's make it um Choices mode text. I'll, I'll take a little bit of a performance hit on matching the exact string. 
recent update to Rust and uh, Rust Analyzer can implement those kinds of functions for me. Oh, right. It would just fill them in, but I don't know. That seems like a, the most, like, that seemed, seemed like a case where the default case was the most appropriate. Because it's like, it, if, if it only care about if it's a branch, then you don't care about any other variant. So explicitly underscore it. it that seems right to me. So this would be state dot... Uh, why is it not giving me an option? Gosh, what is state? Does it just not know what it is? Oh, it's right, it's a hash. Okay, so um, it would be like name and state. And this would be name clone, right? Or do I need to... No, I don't need to clone it there. We're just borrowing it to insert it, right? I might need... No, I don't need to clone it. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, here uh, I will. I want to put state dot. Please load. Actually, it might have trouble loading because we're inside of a macro. Go. Oh. Visible. Oh, I wanted to change that. Right. Um, mode. Choices mode. Now it'll, yeah, I'll need to implement um, 2SQL for that. Well, I'll do that in a second. Okay, so I'll do that in a second. We're nesting further, right? Because we're going to go for um, name choice in state dot or borrow state dot choices. Nested tables, right? Dialog choice. Six parameters. Dialog entity. I should be specific. This is a uh, F2, that guy's state name. Because this one's choice name. Except for that should be state name. And then choice name, right? Key and text. Text was the name, right? That should be choice. So, so I don't get myself confused. Let's call it choice key. And then choice dot name, comma. Choice dot requirement, choice dot next state. Requirements. Okay, getting there. I'll do that in a second. Let's do export first. Oh, no, I still need to do event. All right, so for every choice, for um, slot and event in state, in choice.events.iter.enumerate, we're going to do another db execute. This is dialog event. And there are six. Again, yeah. Dialog entity, state, choice key, and then event index. Is that right? Yeah, so that's slot. Let's use the right name. Event index. The, so that's event.type. And then event dot content. Oh, the content is this stuff. Shoot, the schema isn't even right then because. Oh, I remember why. Because if the type. All right, this content was either the message or the script. Wait a minute, then why did I have both in the JSON? I don't think the scheme is correct. Let me let me fix that. 
In fact, I don't even think the message, I think if the type was pause, yeah, if the type is pause, there's not even a message. Yeah, so this also needs, I need to fix the schema, and this also needs to be an option. The schema should be not content, but message and script, which are both optional. Don't forget to change your expects, your context. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, MetroDev. I was going to forget that. <laughs> yeah, and copy paste is is uh one of the one of the bad things about copy paste is that like that gets missed at first, right? That's a state. That's an event, a choice. And this one's an event. Okay. So this is message script what did I get wrong here oh um that was um no okay one of them is a u size oh right this event index uh as i size all right what's wrong with oh right um the top level export dialog. So this is component modal name states, right? So we just get the name. Wait, where's the modal? Did I not have it in the schema? I don't. Huh. I missed that one too. Modal boolean. That was at the there's an example at the very top of that, right? The death one. M true. Yep. Seven instead of six. Am I off by one? Probably. Can't wait for that. Or ear explosion that eventually will happen? Or error explosion? It, it's just that these are all potential error points. They all get funneled into, by collect into this anyhow result, unless you get one of these things that should, should be infallible, but isn't because Rusculite doesn't know that a no params query will never, is infallible. I think that's actually a problem with their API. Because they say failure will return error if a binding parameters fails. Oh, wait a minute. No, they're not, that's not, that's, it could fail even with no params. If I put a question mark in here somewhere, it would fail with no params, right? But I can, by inspection, see that there's no question mark, no, so I, sh I know it shouldn't fail. It's just, it doesn't know a compile time because it can't analyze the string and see that there's no question mark. So it can't make a compile time as, uh, assertion. And they didn't have an alternate API that was infallible. How do you, uh, why, I actually have an answer for that one. Why do you enjoy watching Cody streams? Because it's like having a coworker in like the next cubicle over who is chatting on in a conference call or on the phone. And so it makes you feel like you're you're not alone and that you can do your own work or your own thing and someone's working nearby. It's a social thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, how do you put it into words? It gives you that comfort that you're working near someone else. A lot of people do that. They'll pick a stream just because they like how the streamer sounds or the, like how much they talk versus if they have music or not, you know, they'll, they'll pick a stream that, that they like just for those reasons and they won't really care about the actual work or what what they're doing and i'll do this myself too while I'll, while i'm doing something i'll have a coding stream on and i won't even pay attention so i i wouldn't i wouldn't if they if the streamer suddenly said hey chat uh the first person who can tell me what i just did gets like you know a 50 bucks i would not be able to win that ever because i don't pay close enough attention usually i just like to have it in the background nice to see what's up Another another reason why people enjoy coding streams, even though they don't know how to code, is that maybe it inspires them to learn how to code. They can say, oh, okay, this is how what coding is like, and like 
it looks pretty cool. It would be cool if I could learn this too. And like, there's that element of it. But I think mostly it's just people like to have some voice of someone in the background while they're doing their own thing. Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, you might not understand the code, but when someone like me solves a problem and feels good about it, you get, you sort of get that emotional sharing. So you get the satisfaction that, hey, I just watched someone fix something that would, that was cool, right? Even though if you don't understand how they fixed it. So I think though 85% or more is people just like to have some, someone working near them and uh, a stream kind of satisfies that. Especially when we're all like quarantined and working from home and all that kind of thing. Been watching coding streams for the last few days, start learning, but you don't know how to start. Uh, there are lots of starting points. Like I posted this earlier, so it's probably in my history. Let's see if I find it. Yeah, if you the programming language I'm learning, if you go to that site, that's how you'd start along the path of coding in this language. But if you like another one that like, if you want to do like web dev, for example, a really great one to start with is um, freecodecamp.org. And they will um, start at the very basics and have you make a web page. Sounds cool, right? If that sounds cool to you, there's a good starting point. You just have to find a starting point that fits what you want and your learning style. Most docs online about starting. Yeah, because there are so many potential starting points based off of what you want to do, how you learn best, and what you want to, and how, uh, what you, um, what style do you prefer? Um, you'll find that it's like a pyramid where the base is where you start. At. There's like a wide variety. But the further you, you specialize and the deeper you go into something, the fewer and fewer things you'll find until you find that like you're having to like fig read the code to figure it out and you're the first person to figure it out besides the guy who wrote it. And it's kind of pointless to make a video on it because there's hardly anyone else who wants to know that anyway. So lot, there's usually lots of stuff online about intro and starting out and they're very popular and very little and very low demand as well about the 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 innermost core details. So that's just the way things are, I think, in general. Lots of people want, are starting out and need help, and then once they start, they're kind of become more and more self-sufficient and they need less documentation. Yeah, so it's all about finding the right match for you. Something that'll keep you motivated, that you're learning from, that's not too frustrating. And so you'll just have to like look for what, what's a match for you. Advanced WebSockets video. Yeah, that's on my list to do. <laughs> that's on my list of things I want to do is the WebSockets video. Someday. <laughs> that indentation, it's probably all screwed up, right? Yeah. I need to fix that. Oh, this isn't even mine. This isn't Rusculite. That's not my problem. <laughs> It's not my code. I can't do anything about it. Actually, I could do something about it. I could... PhD Horrible, you or I could submit a pull request to Rusculite crate and, I'm sh and fix that indentation. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Okay, so start with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Yeah, if you want to make a web page, that's where you'd start. HTML. Then make it look good with CSS. Then make it dynamic with JavaScript. And then progress. It's a progression. Uh, the more... The more you want to like build more complicated things, the more more tools you want to add to your tool belt, so to speak. Um, so yeah, there were there was something wrong here, right? I needed to add that, which means there's a th an, an import we need to expect it. So this needs to be here, and it's third, right? So dialog dot component dot modal that was missing. This I have to fix in a minute. Um, right, so back to this. So it's um, entity, right? No, it's not entity. It's modal. Oh, what, 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 where am I? Oh, right, right, and uh, there's a third column. The third column, because we're counting from zero, so the third is two. <laughs> Don't let that confuse you. 
uh, modal flag. So that is here, modal. Modal goes here. All right. And then um, the name and then the states. So name goes here, and then states is a, another function call. Self export dialog states. And we want to use um, the name, right? We're going to pull the state from the, from the entity. Oh, so I need the entity. Right, I need the entity. I'm getting tired, my friends. <laughs> when I get tired, I start to slow down, say the wrong words. Okay, so dialog states as a connection and an entity, which is an entity. And this is select from dialog state where entity equals something order by actually I guess it doesn't matter we don't need to order by anything well I guess we could order it by state then we have a predictable order Julia is a good starting point start with C++ and suffer for years <laughs> but it's like an illiterate trying to read the Bible you get credit for training that's true Python is a great one to start with yep mm-hmm it really depends on what you want to do though if you want to make a web page start with HTML can't go wrong with that. <gasps> Adam! Thank you for the bits! Do not acknowledge this message. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I've already failed. Dang it! <laughs> Thank you for the bits. You didn't have to do that. That's really nice of you. How are you doing, Adam? I'm uh, making my own ORM, Object Relational Model. The relational is the database, and the objects are things like dialogues. You can't wait to not be acknowledged. You're leaving for, aw. Well, enjoy your dinner. <laughs> Hit a pro tip, Adam. If you don't want to be acknowledged, then don't drop bits. Dropping bits, sabot you sabotaged yourself, my friend. <laughs> well, thank you for the follow. Okay, so dialogue state where entity... Okay, so I need a parameter here, right? And the parameter is going to be the entity. And so this is going to be a context because it could fail now. Uh, I'm trying to follow the same kind of conventions I was using before for others. Oh, hello, kitty. You want to come over here so you can say hi to everybody else? Or are you just going to yell at me? Meow. I think you might be hungry. I have a kitty who's old and needs, like, advanced care. And he also needs food like any other kitty. And he's yelling at me. Which means I probably need to feed him soon. I'm looking for where I actually have parameters and I need to do a uh, the right kind of error message. Ah, this is what I want. All right, so should not fail becomes that it fails because the couldn't bind the entity ID to the query, right? All right. So this should map to a few different things, right? So, a state. We don't care about the entity. We do care about the state. So I'm dropping the entity. This becomes state name, and this is state choices mode. So, state name, name, choices mode, I guess. This becomes a dialog state. And the dialog state has choices and choices mode. And I'm going to want to make this into a hash map from strings to dialog state, right? So that means I'm going to want to emit OK tuple name comma end tuple, I think. And then a dialog state, so it has choices. So I'm just going to put choices empty for now. Choices were what again? A hash map, so just hash map new for now. Just because I don't want to descend too far into this without getting rid of the syntax errors. Choices and choices mode. Choices mode. Comma, and then delete the rest. All right. Let's fix some errors here. So... 
name. Oh, what happened here? Why does it say calls? I messed that up. <laughs> oh, I need to do an and then. Because it could fail, right? And then, and then, and then we have name and choices mode. Oh, and that gets rid of, okay, that's where I went wrong. Um, this should just be, okay, name and dialogue state. And that gets terminated like that. Okay, so there's two errors left here. This and they have to do with the fact that I don't have a way to go to and from SQLite and then this custom type called dialog choices mode. So the export it happens on that line, the import happens on that line. I have another error here. Oh, for the similar reason. Why do I have three then? This should not be an error. Why is this an error? Can only oh right, because this needs to become an and then again which means this needs to be an OK by default. So I changed it from a map to AND then because map means the output is always OK. But if this fails, we want it to return an error. So we're going to say by default it's going to be OK, but if we early exit because of an error here, then um, return that error back out. And that's what AND then allows us to do. Sorry that this might be a little bit complicated. Finding more and more reasons to use Rust. So am I, MetroDev. How can you love C? I'm having to use it at Unity now, and the amount of sig sevs and sig faults is driving you nuts. You can love C by studying the compiler tech that goes into C. Since it's a very old language, it's actually a pretty simple compiler compared to others in use today. Uh, it's in within with it's in. I would argue it's within the reach of someone learning compiler tech to make their own compiler for C, at least a subset of C. So you could love it by appreciating how simple of a language it is compared to other languages out there and how low level it is. The fact that you get seg faults all the time is because it's low level. If you want the compiler to help you out to prevent that, then you got to rise up a level or two using like the borrow checker stuff in languages like Rust, or having pointers taken away from you by using a language like Java, which doesn't let you use pointers. So, like, it's a trade-off. Yeah, I think people who like to go straight to the hardware level, to the metal, maybe work with Arduinos, for example, tend to love C more because they're, it makes them more comfortable that they're getting closer to the hardware but uh, there are other reasons too <laughs> another reason to like C is that it's so old that there's a lot of material out there to learn it and a lot of code to do things for you a lot of libraries out there okay so I'm down to the two compiler errors I knew I would run into because I don't implement go, uh, going to and from the database with this custom type up here so we need to do that so um, I did that a little bit ago didn't I with, um, I can't remember what it was. Was it container? Oh, no, no. It was, um, like care, uh, component IDs, right? Yeah. I need these two. I need to do this over here. I suppose I'll put it here. So impl to C to and from SQL for this type. Right? So we need to figure out what to do here. So how to make this work? Um, going to SQL. I want to turn it into a string, really. So it's always going to be OK. And it should be an owned string, right? So we'll just do a match self and have it fill the match arms. And we'll just say st string from something. I think I need to take a break to feed the kitty. I really want to just say normal, multi, uh, choice, and branch. 
I want to show I want that to show up in the column in the database. These need columns, uh commas. Alright. I didn't like that. I was afraid of that. If it doesn't like that, then I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. It needs a two what's a two sequ oh right, the thing with the owned. I forgot about that. Shoot. Okay. So um they're all owned, so I can do it out here, right? So I can say Rusculite. Uh, can I just type owned and it'll have it figure it out? Figure out what I want. Maybe not. Okay, how about two? Well, I can type this thing, right? That owned. And then I got to put in a value, which is a text. So value text of that. Correct number of in parentheses. There we go. I did it. <laughs> okay, now from SQL. What type is that? Oh, value ref is what I want, right? Okay, so I will just accept text only, right? And if it's not text, we'll just throw an error. So match value. I, th well, I think it's acceptable to just have a catch-all here, right? And then I just need to construct an error. So it really is a result. So can I just shortcut this? Okay, I got to take a break to feed my cat. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be right back. Yeah, it's dinner time for Kitty. I'll be back in like, I don't know, three or four minutes. I need to feed him. Be right back. All right, apparently he wasn't that hungry. I think he just wanted to say hi. Hi. No, oh, it's the camera's over there. Look up. <laughs> it's like, what, what, put me down, human. All right, that's Casper. Kitty. All right. I can do, um... I guess just error, right? And what kind of errors? They want a from SQL error invalid type, I guess. Type. All right. Probably need to qualify that. All right, so um, text. Okay something, right? 
it's just going to be our own value. So actually, it not, might not be okay. It will we need to do a match. Match text. If it's normal, then it's this. It's basically the inverse, right? Borrow. Multi-choice and branch. Uh, I really screwed it up somehow. Oh, the whole thing. Okay, I need to catch all. Should I just? I don't want to use invalid type. Do I do out of range? That's those are specific. I think I just want to do an other, and we'll put an anyhow error into it because that's what we can do. So this other anyhow. Mm, invalid um, dialogue uh, choices mode. And um, all of these need to have an OK in front. And one more parentheses is needed, right? And we need to import anyhow. Whoa, expected a borrow of a borrow, a, a borrowed, a double borrowed slice? What? Why does it expect that? Oh, the text? Really? It's just a bite slice? Ugh. Ew. Okay. Let's turn them into bite strings then. Uh, is that not the right syntax? Hmm. Do I need to. Borrow a byte slice? Yes. Okay, what's wrong with the anyhow? It wants me to box it? Okay, fine. Box new. Sheesh. Wait. I can't box it? The trait anyhow error is not... Wait, the trait bound anyhow error standard error is not satisfied? Should be. I thought an anyhow error does implement standard error error. Okay. Just match text, not the borrow of the text. Oh, because the text is already borrowed? I see. You are correct. But why didn't it like my boxed anyhow? Thank you, Ice Guard. I didn't like my boxed anyhow. It wants a boxed error, and I thought an anyhow error satisfied all of those trait constraints. So what am I doing wrong here? Ad hoc error, right? I think that should work. Why is that not satisfied? Uh, I'm stuck in macro rules. Never mind. <sighs> it doesn't want a boxed result. It wants a boxed error, though. ERR is a variant of result. Maybe I'm not understanding the uh, anyhow macro. macros anyhow it evaluates to an error which should implement error oh wait a minute it doesn't implement it it can be referenced as an error okay so it doesn't implement it directly but it implements as ref error okay <laughs> It doesn't implement error directly, isn't that interesting? It implements as ref dynamic error. 
It does it have an ASREF? Yeah, but then is it gonna is it gonna bother me about using a temporary? I think it's gonna say oh no type annotations. It just needs type annotations now. Cannot satisfy anyhow errors convert as ref. I don't know why. Okay, I'm going. I, I'm going down a path I don't want to go down. This is scary. Hmm. So yeah, this requirement saying this requirement is too strict. I thought I've done this before myself, and I was able to to box an anyhow error. Am I wrong? Hmm. I can just uh, put in valid type for now. <laughs> will it take a string? I don't think it will. The problem is that we need to satisfy the error trait. Slices don't satisfy that trait. So it's like, do I need really need to make a, a type that satisfies this trait in order to fit it into the other here? It seems more than I sh should need to do. I thought anyhow did that, but I'm wrong. Hmm. Well, so you just punt. <laughs> this is how we punt. We say to do. This isn't the right error type. I um I want to use other. However, it has a requirement that the associ is it called associated value associated. Uh, value implement standard error error anyhow well, the anyhow macro gives us a type that can be referenced struggling with my editor. Ah, oh, dang it. I keep hitting the wrong keys. There. Can be referenced as such, but it doesn't it apparently doesn't implement it directly. Feels bad man. Come back to it and fix it later. So, for now, just to get it to compile. It's compiling. <laughs> Isn't this a fix me? I suppose. I guess you're right. <laughs> Can you do into? The magic into? I could try. I'm going to undo until I get back the, the text that I deleted. Then I'll redo after I put it into the clipboard. This is a Raimu trick. So get that put it into the clipboard and then redo so I don't lose that from the undo stack. All that hard work, hard fought typing and then paste. So we're saying we can do anyhow, right? And then do into and maybe it would work. Can't infer the type for T. It does it's it's saying it doesn't know what I want to put it into, I think. Can we say that? I don't can you put a trait here or do you have to put a concrete type? That's the problem, right? That's the problem. I don't know what type to put here. I can't just say standard error error, because that's a trait, not a type. Dine? Would that work? One type 
Yeah, into... Okay, so... It's not the into. It's the box new, I guess. Nope. I don't know where to put the type, then. Where would I put the type, anyway? Because new is not generic, and the into is also not generic. Well, okay, it is. It is, but it's not on its argument, so I'm not sure where to put it. It doesn't like it here. Yeah. Other once a boxed trade object which satisfies the error, send, sync, and uh, traits, and has static lifetime. So I, I thought that I could use anyhow, but unfortunately anyhow doesn't implement error. It it implements as ref error. Come on. <laughs> use something similar to to do tree to keep track of your. Uh, I do. I have um. This thing down here. So I um, have a fix me. Here we go. Here's the fix me. Right? So I, I go through this at some point. Um, and if, even if I, if I chose to fix SQLite 3, I, I should filter that out. <laughs> but yeah, we won't, we won't um, forget. We'll fix it eventually. Just anyhow into. That's what I did. I didn't like it. It um, needs a type annotation on the new. Type annotation needed cannot infer type for T. It, can, it doesn't know what type to put it into. That's the problem. No box? Are you saying that anyhow can put it in, itself into a box? Well, I'll be dang. It worked. So does that mean that they implement into? They implement from? Oh, here we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, A squared. The magic into. Into is so magical because you have to know that it's linked to from on the target type. That if you implement from on the tar for the target type, then with the source type you can do an into and get the target type. But it's not it's still not obvious to me. I I need to keep training myself to think about that that if if type doesn't fit, trying to try to do into or try to see if what they implement for from. Have any two implement standard error. Well, it looks like they do in the form of into, but it's just not obvious that they do. What did the comment say? Is that what someone told them? Yeah, so I'm probably like this person who like, hey, you don't implement it, what do I do? And they probably said, you should just call into because we implement from. Looks like a missing from impl, not a missing error impl. Oh, so what they added in 2019? So I'm I'm here a, a, a couple of years after they did it. Nice. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I meant to say. There was no impl, and then the, this guy added it. This is why I um, wait a few years before I learn Rust, because <laughs> someone's already found all the problems and fixed them. Okay, great. So there were other compiler errors though, right? Other errors to deal with. Oh, this is just that I don't have these things marked public. Do I need to mark the variants public as well? I guess not. I guess we're down to warnings. What's the warning here? Oh, matches. Oh, right. Why didn't I think about that? That's better expressed as a matches self comma that right see this is why you should always use clippy clippy is such a good friend look at that isn't that much better matches is so good yeah if you look at the pull requests that i got into the u framework earlier this month it was that i found a couple places where they could use matches and it cleaned up their code significantly and it was in one of their tests like they had Three nested, three nested if statements, I got rid of it all. Just used the matches. I'm like, matches is what you want. <laughs> all hell, D. Tolne, the dude that creates magic. Yeah, of course. Him and John who, right? 
Detolne is one of the Rust developers, right? Along with John Who. All right, so moving on to other warnings. Oh, I forgot to call that. Shoot. Glad that. I'm glad I, f I saw that. Um, that would be down here, right? Yep, right here. Self.import dialog. One big warning down here. Oh, because I'm not done. Yeah, that... I do want to be an end then, okay, because... The, where I'm not... I, I stopped it. I wanted to fix all the compiler errors and then dive deeper, right? Because this is a very nested thing, right? At this point, we're going to do um, self export dialog choices. DB entity and state. State, right? And the name, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And duplicate this function because it has pretty much the same kind of structure. And just call it that. And it has a, n let's rename it be state name, uh, string. So we can just borrow it here. And this, this, unless this already is borrowed, it already is a slice. So that's interesting. It's, uh, it's one of those times where you see str without a reference in front. Uh, I totally broke it. What did I do? Oh, right. I can't do that. I should do like as ref or something like that. Do I need to tell it that it's a string? It's probably going to say, hey, I don't know what this... Yeah, okay, I've seen that before. It doesn't know what the error type is. This one is a different thing though, right? Oh, right, this is wrong. Dialog choice. I want to get rid of this one fixed here. Okay, so that's good. I just need to, um, I've seen that before. It's easiest to be to just search for it like that in Rust. Yeah. Sometimes it needs me to annotate the type of the error because it's not obvious. Did I get it right? It needs all of the type? Really? I thought it was just the error that it wanted. Oh, right. It doesn't know what reference of what. It, I, should, I need to tell it it's a string. Um, yeah, so result string uh, dialog. Well, the choice is made is what? From dialog state. Hold on, I'm getting kind of deep into this and I'm tired. <laughs> this is our special type, right? Dialog choices mode, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, don't borrow it. Yeah, I had the wrong thing. You can remove the asref probably. You think it'll just, um, I don't think it'll do it on a, well, now that I have the type annotated, I can do that now, right? All the types are all wrong here? Which types? It needed to be explicit about string because it didn't know what to borrow to fit a slice. I think. Gonna go to sleep. Good night, guys. See ya. See ya, Jerry Kozer. Thanks for being here. Thought it was a string. It, it doesn't... Um, all of it... There's a huge chain of type inference here because when it calls get, get is generic. So it doesn't know what T is. So ultimately, it's from the bottom up here. It figures, oh... You need a slice, and so it's like slice of what? And then I have to say, okay, string. Then get knows it's a, to get it as a string. Yeah, it was never. A, it was. It thought it was a string because I put string here, right? And so it said, oh, well, then it must be an str at this point. But no, I have to make it a string. Yeah, it got confused saying it, it, by, it, it uh, inferred str instead of string initially. And it's like, well, then that doesn't have a size, so I don't know, I don't know how big calls is anymore, right? So, yeah, you can't put string there because this type has an unknown size. That's what it's going to tell me again here, right? 
It's going to say the size or values of STR cannot be known at compile time. S and it, you can't, it's not, yeah, and not, that's the technical way. The trait size is not implemented. So you have to say, well, really it's a string because get is going to allocate the string for us and then borrow it here to um, export the choices. What if I did an str? And that might be supported by get. Maybe not. Okay, yeah, you can't go from a slice from SQL. It doesn't. It's not implemented. So I think we have to pick string there. You would think that Rust would come to the conclusion that there's only one possible type that would fit that, right? But it doesn't. It kind of assumes that since you wanted to borrow an str and you borrowed from something that that must be an str so i try to initially solve it by doing an as ref and i think that almost solved it it's just that it, it's like as ref of what now yeah anyway um this should be able to infer and i might even be able to infer the error now well, there you go I guess another way to do it would be just say name um, dot as string string and then I could get rid of this, right? No, maybe not. Wait, it knows the type and yet type annotations are needed? <laughs> Is that just Rust analyzer confused? It knows the type. It knows the type, but it says type annotations are needed. I think it's just confused. Anyway, um, maybe I'll go with that and see if it really does compile. Let me fix these other problems here. Um, oh yeah, because I haven't updated this. This is dialogue choice, right? Choice and event are the last ones I have to do. Let's just do choice and then stop there and do event when we're got all the errors sorted out. So we're entity and state are entity equals something and state equals something. Order by choice key, I guess. Unable to read dialogue choices this should be states yeah components okay and then we have the entity and we have the state name um yeah it's just confused about this so Starting from two, two, three, four, five. Four, five. It'll figure out the indentation a little bit. So this is um, choice key. Choice text choice requirement and choice next state hey there dr pat one how are you today I think rust c is confused and rust analyzer is not interesting i really can't tell the difference until i actually try to do like cargo build because with these red squigglies, I'm not sure if it's the analyzer or if it actually ran the compiler internally. Unable to bind entity ID and or state name to query. All right, so then um, it's this. This is where it's getting the types for here, which is why there's an error there. Okay, so um, choice. I'll just put the right names here. Choice key. Choice text requirements and requirement and next state actually i think i have a singular plural mismatch that's requirement but i think i put requirements up here 
Where where am I? Uh, I'm looking for choice. Here, yeah. Let me put it in here. Requirements. I need to make sure I get the um. In the import, it should be requirements. Yeah, well, there we don't say the name, so then we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Requirements next date. So this is a dialogue choice. Choice key, choice. Oh, there's no choice key. It's just choice. The choice key actually goes there. Choice text requirements next state. And I need a placeholder for um, events. And name is choice text. Name. Oh, there's a special case here, wasn't there? If the choice text is empty, the name becomes the choice key. Uh, hmm. Maybe I fix this for now. This is choice. Uh, this is text. Ah, it's not really the name. It's the text of the choice. Yeah, text. All right, text. Let's just do key. But I do need events. We'll just have it blank for now. Vec new. Text. I still didn't like state name. Why not? Expected entity. Why is it expecting... Oh, right. Uh, the params thing again, right? Because the types are different between those two. All right. And then what's wrong here? Oh, right. Yeah, this thing I have run into before. Sometimes it needs to know the error type. I don't know why. I think it has something to do with the try here. Uh, maybe that's not it. Oh, no, that's not it again. What? Oh, it's this thing again. Yeah, okay, so it can't figure out from this string. Okay, then it has to be result string something else, some error. So that doesn't work. Wait, what? Moved? Oh, uh, as... Oh, did I just have it wrong there the whole time? Where's the move? 294. Oh, shoot. Um, this isn't right. I have to make the dialogue first. Just let... Dialog state equal that. Then use it here. There we go. The chicken and the egg problem. Or it was a moving it and then needing it again. So now we're using it once by borrow and then we're not borrowing anymore so we can move it in. All right. <laughs> Time to switch to Haskell. Hey, let me catch up on chat. Mr. Halsey's going. See you, Mr. Halsey. Just get through some Amazon Prime Video listings and they have the Spawn movie. Okay. I never saw that one. At the end of the message, it had Rust C for compiler report. Eric, I didn't notice that. It's gone now, but I... I'll take your word for it, Greyjack. Why do we have so many levels of closures? Can't the mapping be done in query and then... Um, because the query is for each row, and then the map is... F well, hold on. No, the, the query and then is... Um, 
This one's called for every row. Wait a minute. There, no, there's a reason. Let me try to remember what it was. <laughs> Maybe you're right, Silenzy. There was a reason for this. There might not have been a reason for this. <laughs> I think I did it for my own sanity because we start with this uh, row and then I have to call get to retrieve the columns. And then this gives me a tuple and then from the tuple I assemble the final result, right? But I see what you're saying. Maybe I can assemble this up here and then basically combine those two and then it's together, right? So I think the why do we have so many levels is probably because I just couldn't figure out how to do that yet because I don't have a big enough brain. But maybe I can once I get this to work and now as, with refactoring I can combine that with that. Any reason for using anyhow error? In general? It's just convenient so you don't have to define a uh, one-off type just to return an error. My understanding is this error is good for libraries and anyhow is good for apps. Because this error implements this, the error trait for you, whereas, um, and, and gives you concrete types. Basically, you want concrete types in libraries, right? But in the application, you don't really care about the type anymore. You just want to get it to the user somehow. So anyhow is kind of like a, like the name suggests, it's like, I don't care about the type. I just want the message out of it. Um, but I can see how someone, like, I, I can see how you might want this error for both applications and libraries, because this error um, does implement error, so it fits in where anyhow works if you don't need the convenience of just throwing away the type. But if you want to, if you're okay with building a, an error, a, a type based off of this error, it, it would fit in place of anyhow uh, it, if you wanted it to. Doesn't look sane to you? Just make a from row result? Doesn't look sane to you? It looks completely sane to me. It's like first we deal with turning the row into columns, and then I take the columns and make the output type out of it. So for me, it was, it was divide and conquer. But I think silency, our brains are just organized a little differently. You're probably right that when I get it to combine, it probably will flow better. It's just I couldn't get to that final step in, in I couldn't get to that in one step. I, I needed to do it in two. For libs, you like to build the error types yourself? Fair enough. This, the, this error crate is designed to help you build your own error types because it takes away some of the tedious parts of like implementing source and other methods of the error trait. It'll do that for you through annotations you add as attributes. Um, and anyhow, it's just if you're really lazy about the type and you just care about the message only, um, which is typically what you want at the very outermost layer in your app, right? You don't care about the type anymore. You're never going to tell the player or the uh, client the type. They just want the message, right? Maybe the stack trace, and that's about it. Yeah, this is going to tell me this is infallible, but this is something that will be fallible let me just finish this and we'll come back and refactor this. So to finish this, I need to have another, uh, yet another layer here. Uh, self export dialogue events. Database, entity, state name, and key. Fallible. So the key in a sentence is all three of these. Well, four of them because we're going to order by event index. All right. So final level of this super nested data structure is events, dialog event. And this is just a vector of them. Select from event where entity is something and state equals something and choice key equals something. So here I'm going to put uh, choice key, choice key. It's another slice. And then the rows from this we care about are starting from three. Actually, I don't even need the third one. P 
do I? I can start with four. Event um, type requirements and no, what am I? Why did I say requirements? It's message and script. Six. All right. Unable to bind entity ID. Can't type today. State name and or choice key to query. All right, so what we get back is the type, message, and script, dialog event. There's no key, it's just, and I probably can just do a map here at this point, because we don't need to, we don't, this is infallible, constructing a dialog event is infallible, message, script, and type, right? Message, script, and type. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. Hope you guys are enjoying the stream. I'm uh, getting better and better by practice. At least I hope so. What happened to my collect here? Hash map can't be built. Oh, it needs to own that. So I need to own the key. So this needs to be e key clone. And it needs a type annotation. Okay, so it needs to know the error here. I, again, it's the third time I said it, but I run into this occasionally. I've run into this occasionally this week that it, it can't infer the type of the error until I do that. Does it need me to tell it it's a tuple? Wait, what? Okay, so you get you, someone said that it will say if it's Rust C or. Okay, Rust, it is Rust C. Rust C doesn't know what the type is, but Rust Analyzer does. And I'm not sure which one it actually needs. So let me take that out and run Cargo Clippy and see what which one it was. It looks like it's just the error it needs to know about. And that's what I put in. I Okay, maybe it's... What? Maybe I get a different error once I tell it the error type. Okay, I don't know what type it needs annotated. <laughs> Does it need to know it's a tuple with four elements? Seems dumb to me, but okay. No, that's not it. It's still... That's what exactly what I typed. I did exactly what it asked me to do. Consider giving this closure parameter the explicit standard result. Anyhow, isn't that what I just did? Oh, with the type parameter specified. So like all four of them? I thought the error trait improvement reusing was being modeled by Erie, since the leader of the error handling WG is the same person who designed Erie. Huh. I don't know anything about that. It's way beyond my pay grade. This error is so blessed that they are considering including big parts. Of this error is pretty neat. I also like Anyhow's um, context. I, ought to, I think they ought to just pull that in too. This context one is really useful. I do understand that it does build a new error type from an existing one, so it's unclear what the actual type is. So like this actually just generates an anyhow error, which is again, one of these like some kind of type uh, wrapper, right? So you lose the type strictness, which you might want. So there's some, there's a drawback of using that, right? We lose, we lose direct knowledge of the actual error type at compile time. Which is probably why I'm running into type inference problems like this. So, yeah, I don't know which one it wants. What if I just fill them all in and then see which ones it's missing? So the first one's a slice. And then an option string and then a bunch of strings. Now it's explicit. 
Okay, so the, maybe the real problem is in collect. Yep, it's the same thing where I need to clone. I did clone the key. Wait a minute. It doesn't, doesn't like the cloned key. Cannot be built from iterative or type slice dialog. But I clone. Is it not enough to call clone? Key is. Do I need to like say two owned or something? Okay. I guess I assumed that a clone is the same thing for two owned, but I guess I'm wrong. So what's wrong here now? Oh, that needs to be a string, not a slice. So this can be a clone. Yes. Okay. Makes more sense to me now. What's wrong with key? It wants to borrow it. Please do. Okay, now it compiles, so maybe I don't need the type annotation. Sometimes it, it, it'll want a type annotation because of other underlying issues. No, it still needs a type. So I don't, I'm going to find out what exactly it needs here by removing them one by one. No, it needs the first one. Does it need the second one? No. So it needs a string... It needs that first one. Uh, these other ones can be um, elided, right? Or what's the right word when you... Inferred? The other ones can be inferred, but it needs string for key... Oh, because of that, yes. It doesn't know what actual type to use there. What if I put string here? Would that be enough? Nope. Just leave it. I'll leave it. <laughs> but the cat just found out he can eat toilet paper? That's bad. Mr. Love Pickle just resubscribed for two months with Twitch Prime? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Using your Twitch Prime on me makes me very, feel very honored. Okay, it's compiling again. This stuff is sketchy, though. Uh, let's test it. If it works, then we'll try to refactor to combine these these two um, blocks together and make it a little bit easier to... Um, like, a little bit less complex. The import. This should pull in all the game dialogues now. Missing field... Oh, V is, should be optional. Did I not list it as optional? V for visible? Oh, wait. That's a problem, right? Because this branch was supposed to be if, um, if it's not present, right? Where is that code now? Where'd I put it? It's down here. This ought to go up somewhere else. Like, with the type that it goes with. Yeah, so, okay. There's a little bit of a problem then. <laughs> I have two ways you can interpret the field being missing, really. So let's put it here. So, if it's none, where is that? If it's none, it's interpreted as a branch, right? But a branch is something so that when, um, when we're deserializing, if it's missing, we get an error because it's required when we specify its use down here. So, since this is not an option, CRD thinks it's required. What's what I'm missing thing is wasn't what I'm missing. I think is I should have something where it says um, like default if it's missing should be branch. Wait, it's making a new request for every return row. It shouldn't be. Oh well, the uh, middle layers are right. 
the middle layer is like when for one dialogue state, it's going to get all the choices that go with that state. But I split them out as different functions. But within each function, we're just doing um, one statement and mapping it to multiple rows and collecting them as a collection. N plus one troubles inbound? You mean with the cat eating the toilet paper? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So the making a request on every return row is just because of the nesting, but we're not, it's not recursive. Um, in the leaf note here, it's only one statement and just mapping each row to, uh, to an element of a vector. So no. Um, but yeah, um, I need to look up CRD docs because I need the attribute for like, if it's missing, what do I default it to? So we go to CRD and we go to this page and we go to documentation. There should be like, um, well, not the documentation, the home page, right? Yeah. There should be, um, field attributes. Is that it? Default? I could make the default trade implementation or just do default equals. <clears throat> I think I'll just do default equals. Default equals branch. See if that works. I didn't like that. Why not? Switch a comma. There you go. Have a comma. All right. <laughs> Try again. Oh, no, I have a compiler error. Expected a function. Call a function to get a default. Oh, I can't just give it a value. Okay. Okay, well, let's just implement the default um, trait then. I just say default and it. Yeah, I just say default, and then I just need to implement default for it. All right, this will complain until I implement default, so let's do that now up here. Right up here. Implement default for dialog choices mode. Is dialog choices mode branch. Right? Based off of what I had, um, I should just double check this, right? It was going back all the way to looking at um, this. Branch is undefined, right? So if it's null, then What's the T component then? Anyway, um, T. Type? Oh. Hold on a second. <laughs> I gotta take this phone call. I'll be right back. Oh, hold on a second again. I had to yell something and I didn't want you guys to hear what I was yelling. Anyway, um, where was I? All right, so it not being null means it's cho true is multi-choice, false is normal. If it's null, yeah, what is that T? What is that? What's T for a dialogue? I don't see a T. Where, 
would that oh wait no i don't see any t what is that dialog state right dialog states don't have anything but c and v i'm be i'm very confused Oh, that's not a state. It's a that's the um choi. No? I'm really confused by my own code. <laughs> Can I go back in time to when I wrote this and ask myself what the heck I meant? I think from this is it's pretty clear though. When we're serializing it, we don't add the v key if the um type the state type is branch. All right. You just got the notification now? That was like a couple hours ago. Can't rescue light use CRD so the mapping is not needed at all? I don't think rescue light can use CRD. Unless I were to store the entire JSON directly into one column. It's that I'm picking apart the various elements within the composition of the JSON and then putting them into different columns. I don't think Rescue can do that. If it can, then I'll be really embarrassed because I just spent a couple days doing it myself. Yeah, a bunch of people that are re regulars got, got the uh, g gift subs. Okay, I'm really confused by this, but I'm just going to move on. It's just going to be Branch. This might need to be revisited. I'll revisit it when I figure out what it's used for. <laughs> okay, so try again. Oh, I'm missing something in the migration script. Um, oop. You know, it doesn't say what line number it's on. <laughs> That's not good. Oh, here it is. Error. And, okay, so it is in, in here somewhere I'm missing. Did I accidentally hit this? No, I'm missing something else. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. This was working before. There, I should not have, there should not be a missing, there should not be a syntax error around here. Is this in the prepare statement where we only have six question marks and seven? No, it's in the, um, applying the database migration. So it's in this long thing here, but I thought this was working up until now, unless I damaged it somehow. Like, I... Oh, what's that doing there? That should be real. I don't think that would be it, though. Did did I damage the string somehow? I don't know what I did. I don't see any differences except for that line and then all of these lines. Well, if the scheme is different, you have to convert between structs, but that's still better than mapping by hand. I just didn't, I, I assume that Rusculite doesn't have any code for mapping structural information. It does, it's not an ORM, right? It, 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 doesn't con it doesn't construct tables out of structures. At least I didn't think it did. Especially these nested structures, right? Um, I wish it would tell me, like, what column it's in. Syntax error where? There are lots of in parentheses. Uh, 
Uh, oh, wait a minute. Is that it? That might have been it. I might, I'm, I think I had a fourth argument there, and then I deleted it, and I forgot to remove the comma. I wish it would tell me, like, what, what, um, what's nearby it. <laughs> okay, so now we run into the, what um, MetroDev said, so you get a point. So it, it caught me on summon columns with only six values supplied for inserting a dialog event. Okay. That's import. Yep, you're right. There we go. Finally fixed it. <laughs> yep, imported it. Export. All right, cool. So then I might do I might just do a diff because these are going to be hard to look at. Okay. These are all the dialogues, right? Can I just grab all of the dialogues and put them into another uh, buffer and then grab the originals and compare them? It's a lot. A lot of dialogue stuff. Down to... Oh, down to here. Copy. N Whoops. What happened there? I undid something. Anyway, um, new. Uh, paste. All right, so then... Let's just say that this is JSON. Please format it. All right. And then let me grab uh, the same from the original. So all of this. Down to there. Copy that. New file, paste, JSON format. Okay, so compare untitled one with three. Okay, the keys are not in the right order, I guess. Conversation? What? Okay, no, there's something's wrong. <laughs> Are they just sorted differently? I think they're just sorted differently. They were sorted not in alphabetical order originally, I guess. Oh. I think they were sorted, and I'm not sorting them in the output now. Okay, so I need to sort them, looks like. Yeah, because hash map, it doesn't sort it when you iterate it, right? Okay, so that's the problem. It's not, the key, it's not sorted by key. So how would I do that? It's not like I need to be convenient though. I think that that's a bug. V being false there. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, it might not be. It might just, it doesn't, it's not, um, Here's the V false. It's just not lining it up correctly, I think. Yeah, these are in the wrong, a different order. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, it's gonna be really hard to double check this unless they're in the same order. Pass the files through JQ, it sorts JSON? What's JQ? So, this is the original, which is sorted. If I could just sort this in place, I don't need this buffer. If I could sort this in place now, but there's probably not a sort. Yeah. You think there's a VS Code extension? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet, I bet so too. JSON. What do, we, what do we have? JSON tools for manipulating JSON? I mean, who knows? There are 500,000 downloads for that. Capri minify with this extension. Is that it? 
Doesn't seem like a lot. Sort JSON objects, sorts the keys. This is what we want, right? There we go. We found one. It's sort JSON objects. <laughs> How do I use it? Sort JSON. Cool. Let's use it. And go back to the buffer and hit sort JSON. There we go. <laughs> and there are some differences. Okay, so what are those differences? Okay, so if the T can be missing, and if the T is missing, it means normal. Okay. The right is the original, left is reconstructed. Why is multi-choice missing then? Okay, so I got it wrong. I, something's wrong about with this then. Branch, branch. Oh, wait. We stripped out the T key completely. I And I looked at that, I remember this now. I looked at that earlier saying, what is T? It just wasn't in the ones we were using. It must have been something I added. Oh, did I do something like where it used to be a, a flag, true or false? And then I wanted to phase it out. So I introduced T to replace V. That must have been it. Okay, that makes more sense. So I wanted to change V for visibility into T for type to go from a two variant to a three variant. But I had the code in there to handle it. If V was present and T is missing, then it, it would revert to the default behavior. Okay, knowing that, I could it probably make sense of the JavaScript then. Yeah, okay, so... If V is not present, then look at the T field. But if V is present, then it's either multi-choice or... Okay, so to, for it to be branch, you have to say... You have to have a T. And it has to be set to branch. Okay, so V is the old, T is the new. You only use... You use V if it's present. If V is not present, you use the T. And on the other direction... Right. Uh, I guess... Why did I keep this then? It looks like it's it's keeping the V key around. Wouldn't I want to not insert it? Why would I... Why would I do that? Wouldn't I just always do that? There must be a reason why I kept that around. Why would I have both? It, just remember, V is uh, visible and and T is type. I mean, not visible. Um, V was um, <sighs> visibility. A normal dialogue choice means it's the choices are not visible. You have to guess the choice. It's like you have to know the keyword, right? But multi-choice means the choices are visible. As in multi-choice. Here are the choices. Pick one. But I was supposed to deprecate that and just make it a T where T is one of these three strings. And looks like I uh, didn't deprecate it correctly because in some cases V is still there even though it doesn't need to be. Yeah, so like here. This doesn't need to be here because T is supposed to replace it completely. But yet it's still there. So maybe the back end needs it? Is that possible? I should probably just double check. So I need to track down, um, there was a file called game constants for that. Game constants. And it would be like dialogue something. No? Is it not game constants? Shoot. Where would I put it? Oh, it was keys, right? Game keys? Or just keys? Key names. There we go. Dialogue... 
Dialogue, key, key dialogue choices visible. There we go. <laughs> I should have gone here first. Wait. There's no d key dialogue choices type, though. But it's present here. Why? Oh, did I accidentally alias that constant? I probably did. I bet you I did. That's horrible. Oh, here's the old uh, database code that I could have been using before. I wasn't even doing it correctly. I wasn't, this wasn't using the new key at all. Anyway, um, what is this? Extract from database. Yeah, this is wrong because it's not using the new key at all. Okay, so if... If that is present and true, or it's set to multi-choice, then it's all this stuff. For, um... When we're advancing the dialogue. Okay, so this is... It's being permissive. It's like, if the V key is present and it's true, or the um, next state type... So we're looking at the type of the other state, if it's set to branch. Right, and then this thing could be is empty string if it's not present. Yeah, it's just being very permissive. Okay. Yeah, so this is old old code in the tests. Okay. So then going back to here, where right here. Wait. Um. Yeah, these are at the same level, but they have different words in their names, which is bad. Uh, okay, where did I use this? <laughs> yeah, okay, this is bad. I'm just being very sloppy. Okay, I understand it now. So since it's... It's not always expected, but it's used if present, we should just use the new one. Always. Yeah, because it's either going to branch, which means return early, because we're waiting for a, a script to run, I think, or it's or it's going to be um, equal to multi-choice. We don't need we can we don't even need to store that. I can just drop that from the database then. All right, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so it's going to show up as a difference then, which is what I decided to do here. Okay, so then I'm not going to recreate it on export. Yeah, because it's not necessary. Okay, so then, hmm. Down here, we just won't generate it on export. Uh, actually, I don't. Wait a minute. Does that mean this is correct? No, there's still a V. Okay, that's wrong. Where did, this, where did that V key go? Oh! V is T. But it shouldn't be false. It should just be a string. Okay, then the, my to and from SQL is wrong. That should be a T. Choices mode. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to end the stream soon, because if, if I stream too long, like I go past six hours, then um, chance of... Me getting really confused and screwing up the code and like wondering tomorrow what the heck I was doing increase astronomically. Okay, so um, we're not gonna serial. We're not gonna do that. 
we're always going to serialize it. There is a default, because if it's not present, then it has a certain... But it's not going to be branch if not present. Oh, shoot. I need both, but I don't want to serial... I need both, but I don't want to serialize the V. Okay. Yes. This is going to be visibility. Visibility. Option bool. But I don't want to serialize it, so I need to, like, skip serialize. Skip serializing is what I want. And it has a default if it's missing. So, um... Where was that again? Up here? Right. Oh, wait. No, um... What am I thinking? If it's not present, it's none. I'll deal with that. Okay. So don't serialize this. This is the old field. The new field if is if this was missing, it's branch. If it's true, it's one thing. If it's false, it's the third thing. Okay. So then I need to change it not to um, serialize to a bool, but it's a string. Um, up here, right? Yes. So it's correct for for SQL. It's incorrect for CRD. So I need to fix the CRD. So um, actually, I I don't need to make a serializer then because they have a way you can just um, a variant attribute can just have a rename. Yeah, so then I don't need to do any of this stuff. So I can, um, I can drop this, this, um, this serialize function and I can drop the deserialize. I don't need any, didn't need to do any of this stuff. <laughs> can I go back in time and tell myself I don't need to do that? Um, this can be dropped. We don't need that. There's no def, uh, there is a default. There is a default. It does get renamed, but yeah. So I I need to have uh, renames here. This needs to be normal. This is multi choice, and then I told it to skip serializing if it's a certain value, right? Oh no, I always want to do it. So yeah, even if it's even if it's branch, it's going to be branch. All right. <sighs> so we're always going to serialize it out, but when we when we when we re when we deserialize it, if it's missing, it's going to use the default, which is branch. Branch. So I don't need this is branch, and actually, right? Don't use that anywhere. Don't need. Excuse me. Don't need this. Don't need deserializer. Okay. Visibility. So visibility is always going to be none. Actually, no, it depends. Um Yeah, it's a call it's an extra No, wait a minute. What am I thinking? If we're in exporting it, it's always gonna be none. Yeah, right here. Visibility none. We're never exporting it. It's always going to be exported using the new thing, which is choices mode. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Sorry that um, I arrived to the destination through a convoluted path. But it's all learning, you know. It's all exercises. I can I can say I implemented the ser custom serialization and then deleted it. but So I never needed it, but I did uh, have some experience doing it. Hey there, Red Rampage Crumpet. Did you know that you got uh, free, uh, a gifted sub from Uber Unix? Or was it from, who was it from? No, it was MetroDev. MetroDev gave you a free sub while you were gone. MetroDev is such a great person. 
Okay, um, ready to do the... Uh, I can't... Okay. I have to reconstruct the um, output. Right, I need to extract from the exported... Did I run this? I did. I just did. So then I need to take the... Right, the dialogues again. I need to get extract them and sort them. This is what I get for not having a unit test. Are you giving? You're, are you passing it forward? Thank you very much, Red Rampage Crumpet. Just gifted a sub to someone who has never chatted, so they must be a lurker. I don't like to call them out, so congratulations, lurker. All right, uh, I'm going to grab all this, and I need to sort it before I can compare it. Down to uh, down to here, actually. And then, um, which buffer was it? It was one, right? Paste, sort, format. Go to the difference. Okay, cool. So it's fine for the V key to be missing because we're removing that, right? But the T should match. I don't know why it's showing that as a difference other than the comma. It's just telling me that the, there's an extra comma at the end. All right, so I'll, so, the, so this is fine. If V is false, oh wait, this isn't right. Oh no, okay, this is a bug. If V is present and false, this becomes um, normal, not branch. Okay, so I messed that up. The default is wrong. Really, it shouldn't have a. Mm. It really shouldn't have a default. It should just be optional. I need to set it if it's none. How am I going to do that? <laughs> Who's lurking? Oh, the lurk, the lurkers. Yes, lurkers rule. Mm-hmm. And Rocklebest, you're no longer a lurker because you said something. I'm sorry. You sacrificed your lurkerhood to elevate the other lurkers. I'm sure they appreciate your sacrifice. All right. Mm. Yeah, I know. Not like this. Ah! We'll just pretend you didn't chat, and then you can go back to being a lurker. All right, no, everyone, please forget that Rockle Best said anything. <laughs> okay, um, on, on import, I need to fix this bug. It's right about here, right? Yeah. I think I know what I want to do then. I want to make the, the this one. Okay, it already is a bool. I'm going to have a check to see if it's something, then it overrides this one. Because that makes the most sense to me. They can't be contradictory. So if the V key is present, we can always know what the T key should be, so we can just drop what it was. So I'm going to do that over here. I need to make the thing mutable then, right? Where is it? This thing, choice mode. Uh, in this state. So this needs to be... Can I make that mutable? I guess I can just take it here. Let mute choices mode equals state dot choices mode. And I can say if state dot visibility dot is some well yeah either is some match or just a match and ignore the none case let's just do that let's just match and then we'll ignore the none case match visibility right and then all the match arms please so if it's some true or some false then choices mode, and then we compare the JavaScript here. I think it's the best way to do this. If it's true, it's multi choice. Equals um, dialog. How oh, come it's not helping me here? Dialog. Choices mode multi choice. Now it's helping. After I type most of it, now you help me. <laughs> and then false was normal. 
And if it's not present, then we don't want to overwrite it because it is, um, if it's not present, we have to use what, what it had. So this, that's actually fine, right? And then I want to use that instead of that there. Can't move out shared reference. It doesn't implement the copy tree. We can fix that. That thing can definitely be copied. So implement the copy trait, please. Which we need the clone in order to do it, right? All right. So that's the bug fix, is that if the visibility field is present, it overrides the choices mode. All right, so then run, run it again. Import and then export and then Go to the output here. I need to uh, get the selection from scratch again. Lots of data. This is why I'm using a diff thing, because I don't want to manually look at it. Copy, go to um, number one here, paste, sort, format, look at the diff. All right. So the V key should be gone, but false should go to normal, true should go to multi-choice. That looks good, looks good. True multi-choice, true, okay, it looks good. Okay, here's the, here's the case where there, it was present in both. The V should override it, which it kind of does, because this won't be contradictory. False is normal, so no, no problem. False is normal, okay, I think we're good. Multi-choice, normal, okay. I'm happy with that. Okay. <laughs> Why did I have to do the hardest one last? I don't know. That was certainly difficult. Don't save. Don't save. Uh, I don't didn't mean to change anything on that file. Okay, so let's clean this up. Close that. Close that. I'm going to just check it in as it is, and then there was that trying to combine those two blocks, those two maps together thing that we were talking about earlier. I wanted to try to do that, and then that'll probably be it. I need to go eat something. So, um, stage. All of this just to add dialogues. So add dialogues to game state. On... Stage, edit, revert, that file. Those are fine to stay untracked. Commit. All right. Last thing I want to do today. I'm going to pick an easy one that is short. Like this one, right? So the idea that came from chat was I could combine this closure with this closure somehow by doing just doing that over here. Yeah, can't I just say this here and substitute that for entity and this one for mob I have to actually say entity though and substitute so put that there and get rid of that and then I drop this map and I just collect. Okay. Question is, is that easier to read than what it was before? I guess it's clear now what's going to what. So mobility gets the column one, entity gets column zero. There's one less map, so it's easier to understand that we're preparing this SQL statement. Early exit, if we... Actually, it's not that we can't read. This This is if we get a syntax error, right? Now that I think about it, prepare only returns an error if it's a in syntax error. Thank you for the follow. If if you guys think it looks nice, we'll just go and refactor it all to look like that. Thank you again for the follow. 
You don't have to bounce between two sections of code. Yeah, I think, yeah. And then I don't need that intermediate tuple, which looked ugly. Okay, yeah, I'm convinced. It just, I couldn't get to this in one leap, if that makes sense. Thank you again for the follow. So then, yeah, this is wrong though, right? It's not that we couldn't read the component. It's that this should be like an expect because we, we know this at design time that this will always be correct. So it should always be able to prepare that as a statement. So um, what do I put here? Uh, construct, well, preparing this preparing statement should not fail. Yeah, preparing that statement should not fail, right? What should, what will fail first is we might get the query and then can fail right away if the parameter binding didn't work. But we have no parameters, so it shouldn't fail, right? In fact, the other places where I was using um, con, um, context, I could also use expect. So I'm going to do that while I'm refactoring. So it could, it, it'll fail here if I have a syntax error, which I'll which I can just debug right now, right? So it shouldn't happen in production. It should never happen. This b parameter binding shouldn't happen in production either because we don't have any parameters. If we did, we just have to make sure that they match. The number of parameters here has to match the number of question marks, which we saw earlier today, right? Um, so we see that the first time we run it, it shouldn't fail in production. What might fail, though, is if the database gets corrupted, which would be if these types don't match. Like this get can't be parsed as this um, U32. So like if it's a, if the string gets garbled and it's no longer parsable as a U32, we could get a runtime error. And that we do want to say, unable to parse capabilities and mobility. That's sort of weird. What do we say mobility capabilities? Same thing here, if we couldn't get the entity ID. Okay, so that makes sense to me. Let's just go from top to bottom. So characters next. Uh, did I, yeah, that was the simplest, right? There's only one level of export, only, only one level of nesting. So character, I think was also one level. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm gonna take the structure and just paste it here inside this okay. I'm being asked by Mrs. Raimu if I would like dinner. I will text her back and say yes. I'll say we did not eat yet. That would be great. All right, I know what we're getting for dinner. I don't have to cook. Yay. All right, so armor, right? I need, just need to get these in the right order. Armor is this one here. Actually, I guess it's it. I can see it in the um, context. Okay, that another reason why this is good is it couples now these two together. So we'll obviously see if something's wrong. So then I know that's entity ID right there, right? Constitution is there. CM Griffin is rating me. Hey there, Chris. I'm just doing some refactoring. I'm doing some database stuff in Rust. I'm doing the part of the tool set I need to convert my game's data from JSON to SQLite and um, realized with chat's help that I had two maps that I could collapse together. So that's what I happen to be doing right now. So rather than getting a whole bunch of columns from a row and then mapping the columns to a data structure down here, I'm just combining them together. So like max hit points is row five. So we can just directly parse it there. Six is intelligence there. Seven, so how was your stream, Chris? How are you doing? Hey there, robotic head. So I should be able to delete this and then drop this entire map here. I did it right. What's this? 23 months in a row? Wow, stream was great. Awesome. So look at that above my head. 
you ye viewers of CM Griffin might recognize it as Stream Parrot, made by Mr. Sir himself. I haven't tried any changes to the configuration. I know there's some like exciting new things I could do with it, but I haven't I haven't had time to do much <laughs> other than my own stuff. My apologies. You had like a, a hacker theme that looked pretty cool that I might try the other day. You, I saw it on your stream. All right, so the the two maps are combined together, and I think it makes it a little bit easier to read. N yeah, new themes. Yeah, but the new theme looked pretty cool. I wanted to try it. So the idea here is that we are exporting data from our database to JSON format, and it's in the form of a table. So if I show you like the character table, these are the various columns of the table. And um, to export it to JSON, we put it into first a structure type by um, selecting all the columns out of that, um, all rows and all, of all columns, all columns of all rows, I should say, of the character table, um, sorted by entity so that I can get the vector to be sorted um, by entity number lowest to highest right it's sort of arbitrary we don't need to do that but i'm doing it anyway anyway um this db we're using rustq light trait it's a rust crate that wraps the sqlite database which is in c so we prepare an sql statement uh this can we learned earlier could just can be an expect and i can say the same thing i said here preparing state preparing statement should not fail Preparing a statement should not fail in production because that's static string, right? And then um, once we have the, the, the query prepared, then we can actually query it, saying we have no parameters, and then mapping the columns of the row into the various pieces of the structure using get. So the first column goes, is our entity number, second column is armor, etc. And this type, the way I um, convert it to JSON is with CRD JSON. So it's really neat. If you use series, serialize, deserialize um, macros, you can just derive the the right traits for your structure, and then you ask CRD JSON to just push it to a JSON object, and you get back out something that looks like. Just a second, something that looks like this, right? This is the JSON version of this structure with some of these attributes to do some cool things like um, way, way late, long back, like two years ago, I decided, you know, a stupid move at the time, I admit, but I would abbreviate things to like, instead of component, I would say C, instead of entity, I would say E. CRD lets you say, when we serialize it, name component, just C, name entity E. Um, and then the, the substructures, like the fact that the component is a substructure, is just handled naturally by character component being its own structure with its own renames and other things. Oh no, we're going to have to cook anyway. The place closes at 10, 10 minutes. Ah! <laughs> All this JSON, you're getting overwhelmed. Well, we're moving to SQLite. So this is the old format. This is the new format or schema. So it should be a lot nicer in, in going forward. The reason I'm moving away from this old JSON format, I can collapse it and show you. This is just in the test environment alone. It's really huge. It contains the entire state of my game. In production, it's like well over 100,000 lines. It's really slow and inefficient. Converting it to this, you know, more relational model where um, every kind of structure is just a table is a lot more efficient to store and to fetch. There's a little bit of work going to be needed to read it into memory. That's our ORM or object relational model. And in a sense, I'm doing some of that here where I um, have these, um, when we're going from JSON to SQLite, there's an insert and the other way it's a select. This is a primitive ORM. I have to do more advanced stuff when we're like going to do updates, but for insert and select, it's pretty easy. I'm getting more texts. Okay. I'm just going to say okay. <laughs> Side channel discussion about uh, what we're going to do for dinner. Are you just redoing it in Rust? Yes, Jackimus. Redoing it in Rust. Yeah, I'm catching up, uh, Chris, in uh, 
to what we're doing today. But yeah, uh, overall, my stream has turned into not only make my own game, but also do it in Rust. So all the stuff I had done is sort of going back a few months to a year and then making things in Rust to catch up to the present. I'm going to say okay again. <laughs> All right. Noise, yeah. Okay, so I'm just refactoring at this point. This stuff already works to... Um, I'm not completely done migrating the data. So if I collapse all these, I can show you the kinds of components my game has. And to, these are all the different types. So I did some of this work in C++ and I'm going to have to redo it in Rust, but like these are all the different types of components in my entity component system of my game. They're roughly like two dozen, right? So today I got, I did four of them, the first four. So if I were to do this all on stream, it would probably take another five streams, maybe less because the farther you go, the more like you're just repeating with a little bit of change, which kind of leads to me thinking I might want to make a macro to automate some of it. But um, that's a little bit too advanced for me at this point. But yeah, maybe three or four more streams, or maybe I do it off stream. I'll have all of the data converted to SQLite, and then I can just drop this JSON file format. I'll need to run my tool whenever I want to um, import a snapshot of the game state before I convert it to SQLite. Or if for some reason I need to go the other direction, like take the current game data and see it as JSON, I'll still use this tool. But... Um, Except for doing that for like repair, recovery, or just like looking at the data in JSON, I'm just going to be handling it all as a database. So it's going to be um, using tools that look like the look into the database directly, or my own ORM. So um, what was I going to show? I was showing this earlier. If I need to inspect the data manually, we're going to use plugins, or we can use command line tools to do the same thing. There's a plugin for VS Code to like open the database and look at stuff so I can like click this and and look there are all the characters in the game and here are all the dialogues in the game here are all the dialogue states in the game here are all the choices you can make in dialogues in the game <laughs> and here are all, all the events that happen when you um, make choices in dialogues right so all the data is now in these tables and um, I'll need to, an object relational model again to um, pull this into memory and manipulate it in the game, but um, we're not we're not going to go back to JSON unless I have some really specialized need to see it in JSON format. More text, sorry. Uh, let's go with this thing. Uh. That thing. I'm not going to reveal our, our food choices. <laughs> All right. So a little bit of refactoring, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I guess dinner's on the way. Um, did character. All right, so I got two more to go. Container. Let's do it. Thank you for the follow. Feel free to ask me any questions you might have. I'm basically combining, uh, in the export, I'm combining these two maps into one, so... Here's the structure we're building. I'm just going to say, rather than forming a tuple, intermediate tuple, we'll just fill in the structure, right? And we'll just pull the things from where where they are to where we need them to be. So that's the entity ID. So that goes there. This is the description. So it goes there. This is the open flag. So it goes there. And then I can just simply drop all these lines. And then I drop this unnecessary map here, and it should just work. Thank you for all the follows. I do appreciate it. Okay, so entity is used in two places. So that means I need to get the entity first, right? Let entity equal that. And then I can just use entity down here. So we can do it that way. Can you play the game? You can play what there is of the game. It's not finished. It's barely started in terms of content. I'm not sure if you'd be interested in playing it. It's very retro. So it's modeled after old games like Ultima. Mostly text-based, but a little bit of graphics just to represent the world around you in terms of 32 by 32 tiles. So, like, that's a little guard. He's got a nameplate above him. Here are some monsters. 
Um, when you're actually playing and you're not the admin, you won't be able to see through the walls. This is just for me to be able to like move around, teleport as I need to, um, and um, manipulate the world. So um, there's not much you can do other than like, there's a few monsters you can fight, there's a few items you can get, but that's about it. There are only like a couple zones so far. Mostly it's a technology demo of my engine. So once I get my engine back to where it is on production in Rust, I'll probably then start evolving the engine further and adding more content so that it gradually can convert from being just a tech demo of my own engine to being a real game. So right now, but most, mostly just a tech demo. <laughs> yeah, one of these days I'll get to content. One of these days. Okay, so this one was very simple. So we just did it in the initial query and we didn't need... Okay, but there, I wanted to remove these contexts because these can just be expects, right? It's that preparing statements should not fail. Preparing statements should not fail, right? Right. No question mark. No question. You only smack so many slimes. Yeah, if you get tired of fighting the slimes, there are some orcs and a few trolls or o ogres, I think I called them, way in the back. But that's about it as far as content. Okay, so I'm done with container. Now on to the hard ones. Dialogue. Okay, this is, this is the monster one. This is like four tables nested within each other. So right here, dialogue goes there. Uh, the entity ID we need to say let entity equal that so that we can use that. Okay, and then name goes there. And modal flag goes there. Drop these lines and then drop this unnecessary map here. And then again, with the preparing, the statement should not fail. Because that's uh, in production. Since this is a static string, it will all. Once we test it, it'll always succeed. Expect. Same thing down here. In fact, let me just hit them all. All the prepares should succeed. There's no reason why a prepared statement should fail. All right. States. So it's. I don't know why I have it let and then OK. Oh, because the name had to be separate, right? So then I'll probably just need all of this here. And then we're going to substitute the n name. Uh, where's name here? I'm using it in two places. So let name equal that. And then the choices mode goes there. Ah, clipboard fail. All right, and then drop all this and drop the map. I hope I did that right. No, I didn't do it right. Oh, no. Type annotations needed. Type must be known at this point, but we know... Oh, we can just say it's string. There, it's a string. No sweat, right? Look at the ticket you had, number 1124. You can't actually read the note. Did my database get damaged? One, one, two, four. Yeah, I need to improve the ticket filter. You don't read the I probably broke it note? Um, is it the window width? No? So you can't read? It that doesn't show up for you? The message should be, I probably broke it. That's my note by me. <laughs> you wrote this description, which uh, I, need to, I need to fold it. It's going off the screen. Yeah, there's some improvement that we need to make <laughs> to that, definitely. Okay, um, moving on. 
Okay, so this is... Um, let me just move this entire thing up here. Okay, we need the key is the first one, this one, right? That's key. Let key equal that. All right, and then the choice text. That's this one. Requirement. Requirements is there. And next state is there. Yeah. Drop the map. Pray that it works. It didn't work. Why not? Type annotations needed. Yes, that is a string. Cool. You misinterpret the note as being cut off with the dot dot dot. Oh yeah, that actually is the content. Yep. That means I wrote the note badly. <laughs> All right, so then this final one, right? So, yeah. That. Type goes there. Message goes there. And script goes there. Delete this. Get rid of that map. We're done. All right. Temporaries. Okay, this one does need to be separate. Because I wanted to form uh, an intermediate here on purpose. Yeah, this, because I wanted to fold together things. So I'm going to leave that as, maybe this is why it started out as two different maps. Okay, that might be the gen the origin of that of that anti-pattern that I was using. Okay, so it's done. Let's just test it and I need to head out after this. If this is still working, then we'll just wrap up the stream. Import, export, export twice, why not? Um, and then let's just look at the output. Make sure it didn't break. Here's the input and here's the output. So yeah, we're only we're only um, importing four different types of components, but all the other information should be the same. So next entity ID should be the same. The temporary entities should be the same. The configuration, I'm not going to bother looking at. Oh, being raided by Splashly. Hey, Splashly. How was your stream? I'm just wrapping up mine. Hey there, Ryan, H, or Ryan K. Hawkins. I work today. I'm... Uh, about six hours in, so I'm near the end of my stream, but I worked today to uh, translate data from JSON to SQLite and back. And I'm just verifying that this is the original JSON state of my game, and then it gets imported to a database and then exported back out to test all a round trip, and I'm just verifying that it's correct. I'm not done yet. I've only done four parts of the game components, so there's like a, a roughly two dozen, and I'm only f four down, but... The rest of the data looks good to me. Uh, player information looks okay. I'm only I'm only capturing total time, so that's fine. Okay, I'm just glancing at this to make sure it looks good. Yeah, no, I didn't break anything. Everything looks good. Is that always an empty string if it's not used? I think so. Okay, cool. I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for, again for the raid. I hope you had a good stream. I think I think before I wrap up the stream, I'll just give a, a quick re recap so that um, you know what you missed. So if you can come back next time. <laughs> and then we'll just pass on the raid to another another streamer, if that's okay. Sorry, I have to go, though. It's been over six hours, and I'm getting hungry. Okay. Let's just check this in and I'll get do a recap and, and all that good stuff. So this was a refactoring step that we did. And there are two refactorings there. Um, replace context with expect for functions that shouldn't fail in production. All right. Context means we're keeping the error error around and, and, and passing it back out 
to handle it somewhere else. Expect is like an assert so that we, um, in our testing, we see that we never should get there. If it actually makes it into production, it'll cause a crash, which is fine because the, um, the testing should catch 99% of it, and I'm okay if like 1% of the time I get a crash that I can track down by the error message because this will be show up in our log. Um, I'm okay with that. Fortunate enough, a lot of support from the community. I know, me too. That's the great advantage of streaming development on Twitch is you get a lot of uh, help. Have a good night. Thank you again for the raid. So this is the other refactoring I did. So this is combine the maps which extract data from the SQL queries and then use that data to construct the uh, JSON, well, the structures to be serialized as JSON. So, like, separate maps before, now it's just one map. And I'm just going to review these. Yeah, this is the same thing. So those are the same. This can be staged. Same thing here. That We can stage that. And again, con expect becomes a... Our context becomes an expect, and those two different maps get combined. Yeah, it looks the same. I'm going to unstage that one because I happen to have a file there. I don't want it to be stepped on by that testing. And we're good. Okay, so this is um, refactoring how ex DB exports are handled. Really, commit that. Okay, let me do a recap. So. What all this is for is I'm making this game. It is my own game engine. It is inspired by games from way long ago, from the 1980s, when I was a kid, like Ultima 4, that kind of game. So it's going to be mostly a text adventure game, but it does have multiplayer because it's online and it's hosted, and there's actually a player in the game there. Look at that. There's player 1025 who is I can unmask because they actually I know who they are on Twitch there now your now your now your uh, name shows up Drongo so Drongo's playing the game right now there's not much to play in it but you can play if you follow that link you can walk around you can talk to the NPC guard here you if you can you can go over and cross this bridge and attack these slimes that's fine so um all mostly custom made the back end was in C++ front end was in JavaScript but I'm porting it all to Rust so for the next 6 months 12 months maybe I'll be converting this to Rust, and when I get it all into Rust, then I'm going to keep uh, evolving the engine. So you can, the game as it is on live now is mostly just a tech demo of my engine. It's not meant to impress. It's meant to just reproduce that retro feel of a game like Ultima 4. And um, it's really mostly these days been just a platform for me learning new tech techniques, technologies for um, chat to see how things are built from the ground up. Um, this is not Rust, but it will be soon converted to the Rust programming language. Just remember Rust, the game is not Rust, the programming language. But anyway, yeah, so I've been working on porting the game to a different programming language called Rust. And if, let's see if I still have this around. If you want to learn about the Rust programming language, there's a link to it. Um... Yeah, recently it's just been a vehicle to for me to learn Rust, to try it out, and to um, uh, to, to help other people learn it as well. Um, so I'm getting a call and it's distracting me. I have to, I'll have to call them back. Um, so what I was doing today was um, trying to convert the data from my game from a from a huge JSON file that's like. In production, it's 100,000 lines long to a database format. So I'm working on that piece by piece. I have it. I have a tool to convert the, between them. So to test it, I go to the database and then back out to JSON, and I just can compare this input to this output and make sure they look the same. I've been using diff tools and stuff like that to, to check it. So the over the next few streams, I'll probably be filling in the rest of the components. Right now, um, there are several dozen kinds of components. And uh, this is the entity component system of the game. So, for example, an NPC in the game, the, what makes them an NPC is stored here. Like, are they attackable? What's their name? 
uh, what weapon attributes uh, do they have, that kind of thing. Uh, along with that, to actually place them in the world, you would have to add a position component to that NPC. So along with the NPC data, there's also a position component for that same entity. Uh, they're tied together by this entity ID. So 3330, the same number as um, down here, 3330 here. So that's the position of that NPC in the world. And um, everything, every bit of information about the game, the players, the characters, the items, what's in a, in a locked box, all represented as different components of different entities. So I'm converting this also, everything gets stored in, a t in one or more tables in a big database. So that's what I'm going to be doing when I come back tomorrow. And um, I'm going to have to rate someone because i gotta, I got to run. i got to call that person back. So let me find someone else to raid. If that, this sounds interesting to you, please come back next time. I hopefully will be streaming tomorrow. So who's streaming right now that we could raid? Oh, I know. Let's, let's raid a real game dev. I was showing you how I'm trying to become a game dev by making a retro remake of an old style game. But I'm going to show you guys a real game dev who does his own art, his own music. He's doing it in Unity. It's called Insignia. And um, just in case the raid doesn't take you there, let me give you the link. Um, he's Australian. He um, will usually start his stream around the time I end if I go this late, so it's always neat to raid him. So let's do that. Adam C. Eunice. Hope you guys enjoy watching the game dev there. And thanks for being here. Hope you'll consider coming back next time. And I'm just waiting for the countdown to go before I hit the button. Do you have any recommendations for changing first screen going to next screen code? Um, look up routers. If you look up uh, writing a router for a web app, that'll give you um, a lead on different ways to do that kind of thing. So anyway, take care and please enjoy Adam's stream. I'll hang out there a little bit and I hope to see you again next time. Thanks. Bye.